Hello, hello. Yeah, there we go. I'm going to call to order the Albany City Council meeting of Monday, February 3rd, 7.30 uh, p.m. And Council Member Moss, would you uh, care to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Absolutely. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Would you do the roll call, please? Councilmember Moss? Here. Councilmember Nason? Here. Vice Mayor McQuay? Here. Here. Mayor Pilch? Here. All right. Uh, we had the call to order and the roll call. Three ceremonial matters. There are none. Closed session. There was none. So we move on to the consent calendar. These items are considered to be routine by the City Council and will be en enacted by one motion. By approval of the consent calendar, the staff recommendations will be adopted unless otherwise modified by the city council. There will be no separate discussion on these items unless a council member or a member of the audience requests removal of the item, an item from the consent calendar. Do any of my fellow council members wish to remove an item? 511. 55. 56. Five, and I myself will remove um, 10. Do any of the members of the audience wish to remove an item from the consent calendar? Seeing none, let's go in numerical order and item 5-5. Five, five. I guess I need to recuse myself again. For, this is a donation from the Albany Community Foundation, so I'd like to have it as a separate motion. All right, so noted, thank you. And who wanted to remove item 5-6? Um, I ask that that be pulled. I'm, I would like to suggest um, this, is, this is a new committee, and um, it's, uh, I, I think that it might be worth looking at a slightly different structure for this one because of the manner of uh, support for the work of the council that we're going to be asking for. This is not a committee that would be at working as independently. Um, it would be doing a fairly set work plan and trying to communicate, diving into the details at times um, when the council might not be willing and able to do that. But I would be interested in seeing us follow the uh, structure that some cities have of having a subcommittee of the council serve on the finance and budgeting committee so that there is more communication um, between the members of the council who are, uh, who might dive deep into this kind of material and the advisory committee. Is this in addition to uh an appointee said we would make uh, out of the public, there would be an additional council member that would be involved with this? Is two, I, I suggest it be two. Uh, okay. That's that's pretty common, I think, with uh, so these types of committees. Committee of seven, then? It would be. Okay. And if there's problems with voting or whatever, the, the, sub, the council subcommittee members could be um, non-voting on the committee or something. But I think it's good to have some back and forth, more back and forth than we usually do with our uh, advisory committees. Council member, uh, Vice Mayor, do you have any comments? Um, yeah, I had sort of thought about this the last time this came to us. And what I was thinking at that point was having a subcommittee with members of the council on the subcommittee just seems a little awkward to me. You're advising people that are sitting on your committee. I like the idea of having them a little more independent, working with staff and in their areas of expertise, and then bringing their recommendations to us rather than having two of us be part of that process. And as I recall, didn't we have this discussion already and it sort of come up with the... I was thinking the same. So maybe, and, and Michael is, uh, Councilmember Barnes is not here yet. I wonder if we uh, should 
perhaps just not vote on this and look for a concrete recommendation or a concrete suggestion from you and vote on it later? Or what is the council's pleasure? Is there a timeline on this? Our timeline is coinciding with the transition of the city treasurer position from elected to appointed. We brought this to you earlier at the request of the council, and that's why you have received it when you have. Your last uh, work session included some discussion of the different options, but we're certainly able to um, create whatever type of group works best for the council. I think yeah. your microphone might be default off right now. If you, yeah. And we, we did discuss the structure, but I don't think we came to any particular conclusion. Um, so I, if, if others feel this is, this is the best way to go, I'm, I'm fine with it, but... Uh, uh, yeah, my recollection um, is similar to uh, Councilmember um, Moss that we went through a bunch of different uh, machinations and decided the only thing that we could decide on or agree on was the five member appointed. That's my okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. So it sounds like uh, you're ready to vote on that tonight. And any other discussion on that item? Or, or any public comment on five or six, items five or six on the consent calendar? Seeing none, item 10 then, that was an item that I pulled and um, I just wanted to make sure that I, I understood, um, I did ask staff about this one, I wanted to make sure that I understood the, the, the updated salary schedule. So um, the, uh, the, uh, the rather large updates were in the staff report, and then the items in blue that were in the salary schedule, those were simple, simply cost of living updates. And um, also, not all of the positions listed in the salary schedule are filled positions. Um, okay, I just wanna make sure that I understood that cor correctly. Okay, that's all I wanted, any other? Comments, questions, public? If not, then item 11 was? Uh, well, we had written a letter f uh, uh, with our thoughts on SB 50, mm. which uh, between the time we finally got the letter finished and uh, when it might have been useful, SB 50 was killed by the, the, the uh, California State Senate. Um, I personally think it's too bad. I think we do need to be acting on housing issues. Uh, SB 50 was not a perfect bill, and we had made recommendations in this letter. Uh, I think we could still pass it tonight and send it on, because uh, some of our, you know, a couple of the ideas I think were still good ones in terms of uh, defining some of the terms in there would be helpful to cities, um, but. The, the gist of it, the idea that we need to get going on housing is still very true. Do either of the authors want to revise it and send a different letter, or are you okay with just sending this? I, I'm I, okay with sending the letter and maybe with a cover. I, I have been in communications with the person um, who was working on this for Senator Weiner, and I'll just say, you know, this is what uh, we, have a, it did agree on, um, and hopefully, uh, if the bill comes back, we'll, I, we'll be I able to move quicker. I think it probably will come back from everything it, I I'm, understand. Yeah. I think it'll come back, keep coming back. Yeah, I think so. so. Anyway. All right. Um, welcome, Council Member. Um, I, I have a comment, though, light. on that. It, it, it was my understanding that the Council was... It agreed in theory with SB 50, the majority of the council, but that we were going to write a letter to, to sort of state our concerns and whatnot. Um, and, but I'm curious as to why Senator Weiner had on his website that Albany supported SB 50, and it was also on the California City News website. It's not my understanding that that was what, exactly what we did at that meeting, and I'm just curious as to how we went from what we had decided to publicly having Albany supports SB 50. Well, we talked at some length about whether to support or support us amended, and we decided to support with suggestions for improvements, I think, as opposed to uh, support as amended, if amended. 
And right. these are public proceedings, so. Yeah, I, I, it's hard to know. I also wondered about that. I, my guess was that so many cities bought into the, uh, to the, the party line that uh, League of California Cities was putting out and, and you know, recommended not passage, that even our, our kind of slight hesitation was enough to con be considered support. But hard, hard to know. Yes. Yeah, I just think we need to be careful what we put out in, into the world unless we've actually said, yes, we support whatever the bill is. Just, you know, a point of sort of clarification, I guess. Maybe we can more clearly state it next time if we yeah. have such a letter. All right. Um, we were discussing item uh, uh, consent calendar uh, agenda item number 11. Did you have any comments? Uh, Council member. If, if I may, I apologize for being late. I have a few questions on, on 510. Uh, 510. Which is the salary schedule. Uh, certain, certain, this and go back. Um, let, 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 let's discuss uh, 510 briefly and then talk about a motion. All right, I, I just have a simple question. Are we prohibited under any union agreements or under any state laws from publishing salary schedules for any of our employees? I mean, I see here, I mean, I think I see everybody. I see police, fire, so, but I'm just curious. I wanna make sure. Well, do we have, are there any privacy requirements or anything written on our union or agreements that prohibit us from publishing in this document that's on the consent calendar um, salary schedules for any employee or groups of employees? No, they're all open uh, public documents. Okay, they're that's all, all. They're all posted on our website too. It's it's uh, in the interest of transparency. All local jurisdictions do this. Yeah, same. yeah. I totally applaud that. That's what I was after. So I'm just happy to hear that. That's all I had. Okay, thank you. Um, so as I understand it, uh, we are going ahead with a motion for every, th or we're going ahead with approval of everything except for item five. 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 I'd like to have 511 voted on separately. Okay, and 511 will be taken in a separate vote. Um, are we okay to vote on the rest of the items in one motion? And but, uh, also noting that on one particular item, uh, the vice mayor is recused. Can we do that all in one, one fell swoop? Okay. All right. I'm confused about 511. SB 50 failed, so what is it that we're supporting at this uh, point? Came into that discussion. So. Yeah. So, um, so it, does anyone want to move all the rest of the items except 511? Uh, also noting that the vice mayor's recused on 55. Okay, I'll, I'll make that motion uh, on all the fives except for 11 and 55, which we can vote on. Well, we way. don't need to, we can do it all in one vote. Just note that the uh, vice mayor is recused. Okay, so moved. I'll second that, but Mala, I just want clarification. That means I can vote yes or no on the consent calendar, even though 5-5 five five is still part of it? Correct, but the, the minutes will reflect that on 5-5, five five, you did not vote, you okay. abstained and you recused yourself. Okay, thank you. Just save a little time. All right, uh, would you do a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Barnes? Yes. Councilmember Moss? Yes. Councilmember Nason? Yes. Vice Mayor McQuay? Yes. Mayor Pilch? Yes. And now let's have a vote on 511. Any further discussion of 511? Mm -hmm. Does someone want to move 511? I'll, I'll move 511. I'll second. Motion and a second. Roll call, please. Councilmember Barnes? No. Councilmember Moss? Yes. Councilmember Nason? Yes. Vice Mayor McQuaid? No. Mayor Pilch? Yes. Motion carries. All right, and that does it for our consent calendar. We're moving on to the good of the city, public comment. This is for persons wishing to address the city council on an item that is not on the agenda. 
Please note that city policy limits each speaker up to, to up to three minutes. The speaker may or may, may or may reduce the time limit depending on the number of speakers. I don't think that's going to be a problem tonight. The Brown Act limits the council's ability to take and or discuss items that are not on the agenda. Um, is anyone here to speak for a public comment? Yes, I have one speaker card. Okay, uh, please come up. But for, for example, something like nuclear power, well, you are supposed to talk about it later. So we are not supposed to comment about it because you are going to address the notion. Well, I think you. I think it's free speech. You can comment now, but the, ordinarily that uh, comment should be taken up when the uh, motion is considered. Mm -hmm. So at the time the motion is considered, at this point you invite public comment. Correct. Yeah, okay. on each of these items we'll invite public comment. All right. So first of all, there is a question of Albany Hill Park, uh, the gigantic excavation. We're absolutely against it uh, in the area where I am, Gateview, Bridgewater, and the Commons, because we all protect the hill. And I think the hill has to be kept on being protected. Some people have said it's property rights, but actually the Chinese uh, owners who bought in 1969 bought two years after it was determined there was an endangered species on Albany Hill. So that was determined in 67 when that species was, a species of snake actually, of garter snake was proclaimed to be endangered. So then they bought two years later. It was understood at the time they wanted to make some kind of cemetery on, on a little plot and not this gigantic pharaonic excavation of Albany Hill. So that should be absolutely stopped and there are many organizations Albany Hill has been proclaimed to be one of the most endangered and important places in the Bay Area. And uh, it's one of the three places where there are the most monarch butterflies. Actually, you could see some uh, these last few days. And the part that they want to destroy is, one, is the part where there is the most monarch butterflies because it's giant eucalyptuses with a lot of flowers and there is no wind because it's down. So this is the first point. Another point is that in Gateview, for many, many years, we have asked to have a sound wall protecting us from the freeway. We never got it. We also want a 15 miles an hour speed limit on Pierce. Pierce is used as a substitute of the freeway. So it's extremely dangerous. I have been going down the street, the speed limit is 25. I have gone down at 30 miles an hour and been passed on the double solid line by people going at least 55 on Pier Street. This happened many times. I do it deliberately. Sometimes I see somebody excited behind. I put myself exactly at 30, which is already above the speed limit, and I get passed on the double solid line. Uh, there are only two, um, uh, you know, Humps to slow down traffic, there should be much more, and the speed should be limited to 15. Because in this case, a lot of the people who go to use Pierce as a substitute, first of all, there will be less speed, it will be less dangerous. There, is a, there are several parks in areas, in the area, including one for children. And also in the morning, since a lot of people use it as a substitute of the freeway, it gets completely jammed. So the, you have a lot of parents bringing their children to school. Sometimes it can take 15 minutes to go down Pier Street. So if the speed is drastically limited, there are a lot of humps, all these people will not do that anymore. So that's something that Gateview wants very strongly. And here I'm talking on the, in the name of the HOA. The HOA agrees 100% with that position. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else for a public comment for items not on the agenda? Uh, seeing none, we'll bring it back to item number seven, city subcommittee reports, council member reports on appointed representation of Albany and other meetings and events. Uh, council member Moss, would you like to report? Any meetings attended? Um, so uh, are, we, are we going down in terms of uh, uh, regional appointed meetings? Yeah, or? let's start, uh, okay, uh, so I there's guess it's not. Mm. I, I, there's something I, I want to report on, but it's, I think, the last on the list of, of the meeting agendas. Um, yeah, my, this is the, my electronic copy is not clear. Let's see. Yes, let's do city, let's do um, appointed representation first. Uh, 
Any, uh, any reports on appointed representation from you? Okay, <laughs> Vice Mayor? Uh, my reports are attached. Thank you very much for your detailed reports. Uh, Council Member Nason. Nothing to report. Nothing to report. Okay, I have a number of things. One second. Also some things to pass around. Um, we got a holiday card addressed to all of us, so I'll pass that around. Uh, this is a notice of the city of Emeryville reorganization. Um, this is for the HR director. Would you pass that down to staff, please? Um, and she's gone. You know, all this stuff that we're circulating among ourselves needs to become part of the public record, I think. Is that? Uh, uh, we, certainly could, we certainly could do that. So if there's an objection, I'll stop circulating stuff around. Um, but uh, No, it's, it's OK. It just needs to end up in the public record is the okay. only thing. Um, let me first uh, talk about my representation, meetings attended as a rep appointed representative, and then I'll circulate more things. Um, the, well, uh, you, oh, I guess the League of California Cities is not appointed by, <coughs> don't you usually uh, talk about that as an appointed? It's, they're my written reports. They're oh, that's what, that was your report. Thank you very much. Yes, I also attended League of California Cities policy committees, um, the, specifically the Environmental Quality Policy Committee. We talked about two bills that are uh, advancing recycling, SP 45 and AB 1080. And so those are two-year bills which are still holding on and hopefully will be passed this year. There's also a discussion uh, among the um, representatives there of the public safety power shutoffs and the impact on the cities to those, uh, from, from those events. Um, and then I attended a waste management uh, board meeting. We talked about the food waste ordinance, which we're also going to talk about here, and talked about a new program to incentivize and um, give rebates for the installation of heat pump hot water heaters. We, I attended the mayor's task force on homelessness, which was a meeting of the public meeting of the um, Alameda County supervisors and uh, selected mayors from the mayor's conference. Um, that started out a little um, rocky since the, it was supposed to have been a working group meeting and not a public meeting, but uh, it ended up being a public meeting and uh, perhaps not very well noticed. Um, and I have the agenda with me and I'll pass that around in a moment. Um, and. Uh, the, then I went to an ACTC meeting. Um, I did note, I did talk with the staff that Albany has fulfilled all its obligations in terms of reporting to ACTC for our, our um, Measure B and Measure BB outlays. Uh, and the nothing much else to report except that um, planning is going to be starting on I can't remember exactly what, but they're, they're always planning there. Uh, but as part of a planning effort, the uh, new executive director, who is Tess Langell, who used to be the deputy director, is going to be uh, visiting all the cities and talking to both staff and the elected representatives about uh, the plans for, um, I think it might be the 2040 planning documents for a on ACTC. Um, I also attended an orientation with staff for the Stop Waste and uh, for Waste Management Authority and for ACTC. And those are my reports on uh, appointed membership. And now let's move to reports on other meetings and events. Council Member? Nothing, Mason, to, nothing to report. Mayor? Um, I'm I did attend the East Bay Community Energy as an alternate to, to the mayor. Uh, the pension board, there was a CERT meeting last week of um, alumni of the CERT program. I attended ACTC as a, the alternate for Supervisor Carson. Several of us were at the East Bay Division meeting the other night, East Bay Division of the League of California Cities. I'm on the committee to 
to recommend the executive director, the new executive director for the housing authority. So that's started. And yesterday I had the pleasure of being at the Lunar New Year celebration on Solano. And I did as well, the Lunar New Year celebration. Other meetings, Councilmember Moss? Uh, I did attend the uh, uh, Planning and Zoning Commission's public study for a uh, proposal, uh, a potential proposal on Albany Hill. Uh, very interesting, lots of community came out for that. Um, lots of issues raised around open space, butterflies, um, whether it, the zoning that it currently has should be the real zoning that people want, although that was by, I think, Measure K in uh, 1994. Uh, there, we may see uh, people asking for that to be rezoned uh, because that may not be working out for everyone over there. Um, I think the, the, my interest in it was looking at the plans and seeing how they uh, were using ADUs to, um, in part, meet inclusionary housing uh, requirements. And I think that's a discussion planning and zoning might be having in the near, near future as to how well that's, that's going to work in that situation. So you know I, 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 th these are all issues that may come before us while we're on um, city council, um, but I don't think three of us will be on the city council when, when they <laughs> really start coming forward, and it may be none of us are on the city council the way these, these things can take time. And I, I watched it online. I thought we kind of were not going to these meetings, but uh, and this becomes sort of an issue with this finance committee meeting as well. I. I would definitely want to attend those meetings if I can. Um, and I would attend this one, but I thought that it was something we were not supposed to uh, you know, I, do there. I'm not criticizing you or anything. I was thinking of going, and I, I, I think it was OK. Yeah. Um, and Perhaps since he's a lame duck. Uh, yeah. so right. Lame ducks can do whatever they want. <laughs> <laughs> we're all lame ducks. <laughs> all right. Anyway, some are, so some are lamer than most it will, it will be one of our big issues for the next yeah. couple of years, probably. Yeah. But maybe we should just go to whichever committees we feel like going to from here on out. It would be, yeah. uh, unless people feel differently. I just would like to kind of be sure I know uh, what's what. Well, maybe this is a time for point of clarification from our city attorney, because we can certainly stay at home and watch a planning and zoning meeting. And in the past, I've gone to them, but sat in the back and kept my mouth shut. Um, so is there really a difference between those two that's legally important? No, you can. You can do either of those. I would encourage you not to speak at any of those in case they do come before you um, as either an appeal right. or I, as a final decision I asked questions and just curious about different parts of it. Yeah, I, my recollection is that at a previous retreat, uh, we discussed not attending those meetings lest one of the um, members of the body, commissioner committee, uh, felt intimidated by our presence. Uh, but uh, I, I certainly, I, I'm not necessarily of that mind myself, but I thought that was what we were asking ourselves to do. So this, this was not an official meeting. This was a preview. This was an oh, unofficial. I see. This, was a, um, a, a, this wasn't their standard meeting. Uh, it, it was a preview just for this one item, which hadn't even been submitted yet. So the, and essentially this was allowing the public to react to a, a proposal that hasn't even been uh, put in as yet. Okay. Well, noted. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I'm happy to make these things public record. Here's a uh, help save the planet from the Girl Scout Troop in Richmond. Uh, make sure you save water that I received. This is a public record already, the director's report of ACTC. It is on their website. I don't think we have to circulate that, but uh, I do have that here in case you want it for reference. And this and what's not on the um, website is the uh, the working group agenda, uh, but these materials were given to us at that meeting, so feel free to peruse those. And uh, as to how we'll make this a matter of the public record, uh, perhaps we can talk about that uh, later. Um, 
Okay, I don't think I have any other meetings to discuss. Um, anyone else? Seeing none, let's move on to the, oh, are we, uh, let's see, do we have any subcommittee reports? We have subcommittees on a later agenda item. All right, seeing none, we will go to city manager report. I have a few events to highlight and also some recognitions to provide. We have a paratransit workshop coming up on Wednesday, February 5th from 11 to 12. This is at our senior center to learn more about paratransit. If you need help getting out and about, um, and lunch will be served as well. Also at Belmont Village, the police department in Belmont Village are providing a elder abuse and fraud prevention workshop, February 27th, 2 to 3. Hopefully you're all familiar with where Belmont Village is, but it's across the street if not. Uh, we have a number of events coming up. Friends of Albany Parks, clean up and planting on Albany Hill. You know, there's been a lot of attention on Albany Hill lately, so let's go out there and make a difference in our public areas. And Chinese New Year celebration on February 6th. Our staff always does a fantastic job with this event, so please join us again to bring in the new year. We have a clothing swap coming up as well. Um, I think it speaks for itself at this point, but please come and swap clothing. And there was a great event, a Be Curious event, that occurred, and uh, a lot of good feedback on how to make your garden and your environment more bee friendly. Um, following and leading with that, we also have some um, garden talks. Uh, we'll have four of these. They're called Healthy Garden Talks. It's a series. The next one is Backyard Fruit Trees. It will be at our community center on Monday, February 10th from 6 to 8 p.m. And we'll have four, uh, three others, March, April, and May. So check our website for the details on those events as they're scheduled. I'd like to also recognize our um, the collaborative working relationship between our fire department and our police department. We actually had a fire in town on Marin on Sunday. Um, and it was a structural fire at a residential home, fairly minor, uh, but it did have some smoke damage to the house. And again, our, our departments responded extremely quickly and competently and resolved the situation before it got out of control, given how close our, our structures are to one another. So I appreci all, appreciate all the staff that worked on that. Um, a couple other things here. Our police department actually also had a great volleyball event. I don't know if you can see it it's too well here, but our, this is actually our police chief here out, out with the APAL group uh, helping kids learn volleyball this weekend. So that was a really fun event. Appreciate the extra time they put in for that. And the police department also had a training with the district attorney's office recently on their victim and witness division. Um, how to work in coordinated efforts and um, understand the emotional trauma through victimization and how to be as supportive as possible during that process. And also an update for those who have expressed concerns, rightly so, um, with traffic safety on Marin. We do have I call them blinky lights. I know that's not the technical term. The flashing beacons. Um, we do have another one, actually two, scheduled to be installed. One at Talbot and Marin and one at Cornell and Marin. Those should be in within the next several weeks. So we look forward to seeing those installations. And also one on San Pablo and Castro Street. And that concludes my report. Thanks. Thank you very much. Any questions? Seeing none, uh, then we're going to breeze through several agenda items. There are no presentations, public hearings, or unfinished business. So we can breeze past items 9, 10, and 11 on to 12, new business, 12, 1, the Parks, Recreation, Open Space Commission work plan amendment request. Uh, does staff have a staff report? Thank yes. you. Uh, good evening. 
so the item before the council is a request uh, to amend a work plan by the Parks, Recreation and Open Space Commission to include the exploration of options to install a basketball, basketball court at Memorial Park. Uh, the staff recommendation is that the council provide direction on the Parks, Recreation and Open Space Commission work plan amendment request to include the exploration of options to install a basketball court at Memorial Park. So the direction is specifically um, to provide direction on the work plan amendment. Uh, how this came about was um, on a little bit of background on at the December 12, uh, 2019 Parks, Recreation, Open Space Commission meeting. Uh, the commission received comments from residents um, that the uh, basketball hoops uh, that were um, had been removed, uh, those were the basketball hoops between the uh, Memorial Park and um, the pool. And the Parks, Recreation, Open Space Commission discussed the item at the, uh, their January 9th meeting. And after receiving further comments from residents, um, they uh, made the recommendation to, uh, they made a motion to request a work plan amendment to council. And the, amend, uh, the work plan, the f and the, uh, the form to amend uh, the advisory body work plan is attached to the staff report for your information. Um, a little bit of discussion uh, the ba as far as the background on the basketball hoops. They were removed by the Albany Unified School District due to the construction of schools and to accommodate the installation of portable uh, classrooms uh, to relocate classrooms during construction. Uh, we've included also a map of the area uh, uh, attached to the staff report um, that shows where uh, the portables are uh, and uh, where the hoops were removed from. And uh, the, hoops, the hoops were on school district property. Um, following the pros meeting, the city manager informed the superintendent of school of the issues raised at the meetings. Uh, the issue was also uh, discussed at the 2 by 2 by 2 meeting in January between the City of Albany, the Albany Unified School District, and UC Berkeley. Um, and uh, Parks, Recreation, and Open Space Commissioner um, Julia Chang Frank uh, did attend the meeting uh, to discuss the matter as well. And uh, she is here tonight also to uh, provide um, some uh, information on the amendment. And I'm also available to answer any questions. Hi, thank you, City Council Member. It's nice to be able to talk to you about this issue. It's one of the <clears throat> few um, issues that's really seemed to generate a lot of public interest. Um, but just wanted to sort of talk about what's happened since, what, thank you, Isabel, for giving the background. Um, that two by two by two meeting, one of the questions that we had as a commission was, how long will the courts be gone, and what we found out from that meaning that it's at least four years. Um, there's maybe, there's no sort of <clears throat> agreement by the school district that they would put them back. So um, in terms of um, what our staff discussed is we definitely agree that we should um, reach out to the school district and ask them to help mitigate this issue. Um, we also felt strongly that that wasn't enough, that we also wanted to amend our work plan to explore options for basketball court at Memorial Park because that's within our sphere of influence. That's something we can do as a, as a city and obviously the Parks and Rec um, Commission would be happy to lead that process. So we want to be responsive to the public and do so. Um, one thing just to let you know um, is Superintendent Wells, who I had a chance to talk with, seems very um, supportive. He wants to take responsibility for the loss and that um, he's eager to partner with the city on this and to support um, <clears throat> have, having a quick resolution to this. So. Uh, but just want to mention the public comments that our commission received. So we heard from the public at both the December and the January meetings. Um, they submitted a petition signed by over 100 community members, most of them Albany residents, and also um, letters came in from the principal of the high school and the principal of Ocean View in support of this. Um, <clears throat> Just wanted to also kind of consider what the city goals are and how they align with this work plan. Um, one of the things that our Parks and 
recreation outdated master plan, which I know we're going to soon embark on updating our master plan. I just wanted to sort of remind you of one of the goals, which is to provide high quality sports and recreation facilities that accommodate children, youth, families, and seniors year round and at all times of the day. And some of the policies in order to support that goal were to one, for the city sports fields, renovate and maintain city sports fields. And um, another policy is to cooperate with other agencies and organizations in creating new sport field facilities, including the Albany Unified School District. So we feel like in terms of our charge, we're definitely, it's definitely in line with what we're asked to do. Um, but also there's some social equity goals that are, should be considered. For example, basketball, you know, serves a broad cross section of the population. And so, and actually is a very popular sport among girls. So that's something we definitely want to also consider. And I personally, you know, I, I help the city separate from this with the climate action plan. And I think we really want to encourage as much as possible walkable, walkable recreation facilities from any location. So, um, yeah, and oh, the other thing is just the overwhelming sort of youth interest in this. You know, as we as a city are trying to encourage youth participation in local government, I think this is really something that's relevant to them. And um, another strategic plan goal that I noticed was that your city council uh, goal is to adapt programs and services to support inclusivity and to reflect input received. So. Just that's pretty much all I wanted to say, just that, you know, as a city, I know we didn't sort of create this problem, but I think it's a great opportunity for us to help solve it and um, in partnership with the school district. And as a commission, you can be confident that we'll do a thorough process and talk to stakeholders and give you the data you need to make an informed decision. So, and we would welcome as a commission any suggestions you have, any questions that you'd like answered to sort of guide our research into this topic. Thank you. Thanks. Um, and just before I even take questions, I want to remind the council members and the public that the item before us is the discussion of uh, adding to the work plan of the Parks, Recreation, and Open Space Committee uh, to study options. It's not a recommendation that we partic pick a particular option, but only to study whether or not we could uh, possibly accommodate uh, moving, <coughs> moving of the hoops. And there were two hoops, is that right, that were removed? Uh, there were actually two courts, so four hoops total. Oh, four hoops total, thank you. Um, so given that, uh, that this is a request to amend the work plan to study relocation, any questions from the council members? Yes, Councilmember Barnes. Well, I recall the school district was willing to cooperate with us on the traffic guard situation if that meant us funding 100% of them. So has the school, in this, is, in this case, does the school district's idea of cooperation mean they're gonna pay for them or help us pay for them? Is, is that a, hmm. um, I don't know. I, the city sure manager wants to speak to that. I mean, I can say what they've indicated that they're, you know, wishing to support in that way too, but I don't want to quote, right? So, but I, I think that's one of the first steps we should take. As, I mean, I'd be happy to engage in that conversation, try to get a commitment from at that level, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I, we would bring that information back to you, what, what, the, what they'd actually commit to. Um, yeah. So. That sounds fair. If no other questions, then I'm going, going to open up for public comment. Uh, how many people would like to speak on this item? Quite a few. I'm going to guess that your comments, sir, of the perhaps the younger folks are not that long. So I'll I'll, I'll leave the limit at three minutes. Um, but do note that uh, if we if you simply have uh, the same thing to say as the person before you said, uh, that it would, in the sake of time, it would be a speedier process if you just said, oh, I agree with the previous person, and then we could move on to the next speaker. Um, and again, this is a question of whether or not the Parks and Recreation Commission should study the options. So with that, uh, do I have some, uh, do you have some speaker cards? No. Oh, no speaker cards. Uh, that's fine. Uh, if you would just then line up over here uh, so that we could uh, have an orderly and timely set of speakers. 
Please go ahead. Oh. Hi, um, I'm Lucas Cohen. Um, I go to AMS. I'm a sixth grade student there, and every day after school, we would go to the basketball courts, finish our homework there, then start playing for an hour, two hours, until it got dark or we had to go home. It was we. That was like if we had nothing to do. That was where we would go. If we were just bored at home, we would always go there with our friends or by ourselves. Yeah, and yeah, that's okay. it. Okay, thank you. My name is David Frank. My name is Diego Wong. So, um, I used to go to the basketball courts every single day because I live just a block away from the park and with my dad and I'd look forward to it um, the whole day and um, <laughs> sorry, um, I get a lot better at basketball playing there. I um, I had a huge leap playing basketball um, and um, I just got a lot better playing there because I would play against just more high-paced games because the school I go to it's in Berkeley, it's very small and the hoops are really short. So I can't really get in very much time there. And so there I would just, that's where I would, that's where I kind of really learned to play basketball. And it's, and I'm disappointed that they got taken down. Me and him, we went around one day, we got 70 signatures. I got 30 more um, signatures. We have 100 signatures, over 100, like 102. But. So we have over 100 signatures from the people playing basketball right here. If you want to hand them to the clerk, the clerk can pass them to us to, to take a look at. So me and my cousin Jerome, we went to the high school PTA meeting and we um, we um, we got this, the principal of the high school and the PTA to sign the petition. Oh. Uh, I recently moved here, and I liked the basketball courts a lot. And after one month of moving in, I they got like taken down. So it was really early for me, and I didn't have a great experience with it. Okay. So when we were um getting signatures. A lot of people said, this is a great cause. I agree, we should definitely get them back up. A lot of people said, it's ridiculous that they took, that they took them down. Just a lot of other, a, a lot of people, they really, they weren't just supporting it for us. They were supporting it because they were really concerned. They really liked to play basketball at those courts. And they were all neighbors. They were all, we went door to door. And they were all people who just lived, lived around there or, or, or went to the park and Ian. Okay, thank you both for your comments. Hi, I'm Roy Schroeder. I'm Jillian Morton. And I'm Genevieve Morton. We're all in fifth grade and the hoops at our school aren't really accessible because they recently spray painted the bottom so they, you can't play on them if it's just a little bit wet because they become extremely slippery. So whenever like a rainy day recess, kids used to like go there and play, but now they can't because they're just boarded off because of the spray paint. So those were the only basketball hoops we could really get to because the middle school ones are in a parking lot and I don't really know anything about the Ocean View hoops. Um, also, our, the hoops at our school, she jumped up and she could touch the net. That's how short they were. So. <laughs> yeah. And also, we were one of the people that signed the paper. Yeah. <laughs> Ladies, may I ask you a question? What school do you go to? Cornell Elementary. Great, thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you for your comments. Hi, my name is Samora, and um, I think we should um, get the basketball um, ball courts there because, um, like the the um um 
um, the, if there are basketball courts and there are more people playing and more people enjoying it, and I think it's good that people enjoy it. And also, um, like, every day when I walk by there, I just see people playing ba basketball, and um, I bet... Um, the people that were playing when I saw it in me um, would like really um, um, like um, be happy to have the um, basketball court um, and and um, um, also. Um, yeah, that's all. Thank you for your comments. Uh -huh. Hi, my name is Devin Owens. I'm the president at Albany Middle School. I'm in eighth grade. And I was here last meeting, but you might not recognize me because of the hair. But anyway, um, I pretty much agree with what everyone else said. Um, on Saturdays, um, every weekend, we would go to those courts, bring our, score, bring our scooters, um, and we'd always, you know, play basketball there, then we'd go get lunch or, but uh, the point is that we would always meet over there and just going by, driving by, walking by, um, seeing that they're not there anymore, people can't play there anymore. Um, it's really, you know, it's just kind of hits me in another different way. Um, so, yeah, hopefully if you guys can just um, consider that. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Um, hi there, my name is Jerome. I graduated from uh, Albany in 2017, and I was a long-time user of the basketball courts there at Memorial. So I just wanted to emphasize two points that I think were already made, but um, I think are important in this discussion. First is that um, there really aren't that many other places in Albany to shoot baskets, um, especially for younger kids. Um, the middle school is sort of a tough place, I think, for kids. If I was a parent, which I'm not, but if I was, I wouldn't let them play there unsupervised just because there's cars and traffic and um, I've seen <laughs> cars doing tricks there. And um, it's just sort of a secluded place that's hard to, hard to sort of see from anywhere else outside of like being right there. And the second point I want to make is that um, the courts sort of served a purpose that was like greater than just basketball. It was a, almost like a community hub that would serve not only uh, uh, neighborhood, but also like all the students from the high school. And now that we have elementary school students um, in the area, it would also be a great place for them to convene and to have um, and a space to play basketball outside. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi there. Um, I understand that this is not specifically about how we'd go about it, but I'll just make a couple of quick comments and then go from there. Uh, my name is Damon Levy. I am an Albany resident. Um, I'm a very frequent user of the tennis courts. Um, I probably am the highest renter of them because I organize tennis teams. Um, initially, I was against the idea of putting basketball hoops there, which I think is one of the discussion points. But I read their letter. I know some of these kids. I think that, and in, ret in thinking about it, I thought it was definitely something that I actually support. And um, I hope that they can figure out a way to create shared use with the tennis courts. And because I th it, these tennis courts, from my understanding, are one of the highest usage places in Albany for recreation. And so um, if we go about uh, moving the basketball courts and putting hoops up on there. I hope that they can figure out ways to continue to use it as a tennis court as well. Okay, thank you. Next speaker. Hi, my name's Sarah. I just wanted to thank you for hearing from us tonight. I know this isn't a, a problem that you created and we really appreciate um, any steps you can take to help fix it. Um, I just want to give you the parent perspective real quick. The basketball courts have been important to my family for 16 years. We'd go over there and play at night on the, the weekends. And it, I always saw just it was a gathering place for lots of different types of people who would come together and do pickup games. It was not programmed by the adults. It was all kind of kid led and they'd have to work out the rules and who was going to play next. And, um, you know, I love this idea of kind of free range children that they could actually go on their own to the basketball court, which my daughter and her friends did. And they're not on their devices. My, my proudest parenting 
quarantine moments when my son texted his friends, like, get off your devices, let's go play basketball, and they did. And um, AMS is really too far, and really there's been some crime along the Oleone Expressway, so I wouldn't let my kids walk over there at night. So uh, thanks again for hearing from all of us. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening, everybody. My name is Mirid Grembeck. We uh, made my family live a couple of blocks from um, this wonderful um, park. Um, I do want to say that we live uh, in where we live. We live in a small uh, houses with small lots. We don't have a lot of room to go outside and play, so we end up going to the park. Basketball is something that draws a lot of the youth, and there are being out of their devices, just playing in uh, balls. We tried actually after those. Um, uh, court was uh, demolished. We put the basketball outside of our street, and basically my kids now playing on the street when cars going up and down. So safety here is definitely not something we're compromising at the moment. I will also not send my kids walking to um, Albany uh, Middle, to where they do have a basketball. I will not send them walking there uh, just by themselves. So we have this freedom of, you know, just the free-range kids have been taken away from us. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanted to reiterate that we know that this was the, the school district that did this and um, not the city, but we're asking for the, um, for the city to hopefully partner to try to help. Um, I just want to reiterate some of the things that the parents said. Um, having kids being able to, to walk someplace and um, be outside and meet with their community, I think it's really unique. It doesn't exist in a lot of places anymore. Um, and uh, to have a gathering place for kids at the park is, uh, it's really um, important and special. And asking them to go someplace or having to drive them to play basketball some other places, um, really, it's a very different experience. My kids would go down there um, and just meet friends, or I would go down there and play basketball with them. We can't do that now. And my son said to me, um, you know, he would take the dog for a walk and go down to the courts. He says, I don't know what to do at the, at the park anymore, right? The, the, um, the kid's play structure is not really suitable for him. And like, there's not a game of coordinated football or something going on on the fields. Basketball was the thing. I, um, the question was brought up about the tennis courts, and I really also wanted to stress that um, we don't, this isn't an anti-tennis um, request. We would hope that everyone could share and that there are ways to have shared use. Um, I have some just pictures of multi, a multi-use tennis court with a basketball court. Um, they are used, the tennis courts are used, and I, I'm glad to have them there. I play, I'll play there. But there's a lot of time when there's nobody on them, and it would be great to be able to have um, different uses going on at the same time. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for taking our comments. Uh, my name is Su Yang Wong. I'm the um, father of one of the kids here. And we, uh, as he mentioned, we uh, recently moved here. But uh, you know, this uh, neighborhood has really struck us immediately, just sort of how friendly and how inclusive it is. And um, you know, even before we moved here, you know, we got to enjoy uh, the, the, the parks and just many, the many birthday parties I remember seeing there. And, and, and a big part of it was you know, the basketball courts and uh, you know, sort of all the kids uh, playing there. And um, you know, as much as we love our new neighborhood, we also uh, uh, have or are having uh, trouble adjusting to some of the smaller lot sizes in the backyard. So we don't really have easy access to, uh, to courts in the or put up courts in our uh, own backyard. So, you know, the, uh, having the, um, the option to have those courts in the, back in the park would be a really great uh, addition to sort of um, enhance their, um, their experience in the, uh, in, the, in, the, um, in the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, thank you so much. Um, my name is Becca Black. Um, I'm your city poet laureate, um, Cornell parent, and uh, Carmel uh, Avenue resident. Um, I just wanted to make one quick point. Um, Thank you so much for your time. Um, I know uh, this is not something that you all created. Um, and it just seems to me such a golden opportunity to work with the school system. I'll be going to the school board meetings, um, meeting with Superintendent Wells, and trying to um, work, work with them on, on that end. Um, so it's just such a great opportunity with a new superintendent to turn over you know, a new leaf and um, really get 
get um, something positive going for the Ocean View kids that have been displaced, whose recreation plans are are in flux. Um, you know, I know the PE teacher there has been working hard on what they can do for recreation for the 10 classrooms of kids that will be over there um, at the high school, and then the Marin kids that will be moving over, moving over, moving over there in a couple of years. So um, this could really benefit um, a lot of elementary school students as well as our local community. So thank you so much for your time. What, no poem? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Michelle Lang. I'm also on the um, Carmel neighborhood, so I live around the corner from the uh, park. I have three children at Marin, and all three of my children play on a basketball league. And so, you know, they have actually, you know, they go to the Memorial Park to practice what they've learned. And so I don't really let my kids go anywhere by themselves usually, but you know, when they join their neighbors, I do let them walk across the streets of the park and play there by themselves. And so now without the basketball courts being accessible to them, they unfortunately then can't practice, um, you know, what they've learned. So thank you very much. Thank you. Any other public speakers? All right, thank you all for coming out tonight. So back to the council for discussion. Uh, council Member Nason, would you like to start? Well, um yeah, I guess I'd just say this, if, if the, um, I, I certainly support uh, this work plan amendment. I'd like it to be clear that um, they, we'd, we'd like to get um, advisory, some, some advice on, um, and, and by the way, we have, there is a school board representative on Parks and Rec, isn't there? The school board, I think, still appoints two. Is it? Yeah, Arsenic, yeah, yeah. So I think the hope would be uh, perhaps a temporary solution uh, like this multi-use. That, that seems uh, very positive, but also a permanent solution uh, that returns the hoops to school uh, property. Okay. And that we, we see, that we ask them to uh, look at both the temporary and the permanent problem. Okay, thank you. Vice Mayor? Well, I don't, I don't support the changing of the work plan. I recall that when they brought us their work plan, it was extremely robust and perhaps a little overreaching, but that's, that's okay. Um, I don't think adding to the work plan is, is what we should be doing. And I think as, as several people said, this, this is a, the school district really needs to take the lead in this. It's, um, you know, it's their property, it's their basketball hoops. While we do share them, they, they seem to belong actually to them. I'd like to see us be supportive of what they can do, but let them take the lead in this, in this and not um, give it to an advisory body. Okay, Council Member uh, Moss. Okay, th uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I can support adding this to the uh, agenda of Parks and Rec. Um, you know, there's. I, I'd like to f I hear a, a very thorough exploration of all the possibilities, though, and, and uh, this idea of adding something to the tennis courts is one, but I do know that there are, I think, the Albany High tennis team wears at, uh, uh, uses those courts to practice tennis. Um, uh, you know, how is it going to work? Are you someone going to ha be responsible for taking the net up and down? How about the ballards that, that hold the net? Those seem like a safety consideration for basketball. <clears throat> I would also think that we should, uh, although uh, my guess is that it, it's beyond our uh, ability but uh, financially, but I would also think that exploring that area of grass that's between the street and the tennis courts is an area that's usually kind of a mud hole, and um, it, possibly that could be used as uh, at least one court, although that would certainly be, um, it would take longer to do that. Um, I, you know, one of the questions is, is what is the anticipation of, uh, you know, what does the school anticipate uh, how long those portables are going to be on the existing courts? And, you know, what's that timeline? Because 
you know, that, that might influence at least my vote as to, you know, how far we would support it. Um, and if we did, uh, say, pave that, that lawn area, how would that affect music in the park and other things that are functioning there? Um, so those are my general comments. I have no problem with uh, Parks and Rec, uh, you know, looking into this and coming back to us with the with all the facts and figures, the costs, the the timelines, uh, you know, working with uh, uh, Public Works as to what they could do and how long it might take them to do it. Um, you know, I I don't know what the budgetary restraints will be. Uh, it's something we'll have to look at, particularly if we are going to look at you know, paving something that isn't currently paved, if that becomes one of the options, it seems like a good idea. Um, I would say we do get sort of tax money that um, I think we've already uh, uh, put aside this year, but some of that could, I think this would be a great, you know, thing to put some of that soda tax money into, because it's closer to what, uh, you know, at least what I envision health for kids is about in the soda tax money. So those are my two cents. Councilmember Barnes. Well, first of all, I want to say, I know Julia, you and Todd and Brian did a great job on the dog park thing. So I, I do appreciate that. And I think you're competent to handle this, but I tend to agree with uh, Peggy McQuaid on this one that the issues are school district issues and it's not our responsibility to babysit them and hold their hand and you know, try to make them solve this problem because I think the school district has a lot of alternatives. Uh, Cornell has a huge playing field. There could be extra basketball hoops installed there or at Marin. They could do something to improve the safety at the middle school, and I agree it's kind of sketchy at times. I used to run over there on the track at night. Um, they also have a big wide open indoor basketball court at the high school, which I've been by many times and doesn't seem to be used at all times either. So it's so these are issues of the school district looking at their facilities and trying to figure out where they have slack in their facilities and coordinating their facilities. And speaking as the only person on this, well, never mind. Rochelle, you had some. You were on the a student advisor on the school board. That's right. Was the, other than Rochelle, I'm the only person who has been a member of the school board. So I think I have sort of an idea of balance of responsibility between these two groups. And I, this is a school board responsibility, I think, fundamentally. Um, so I would like to see them step up first. And, it, and if, however, we do decide to have Parks and Rec take this on, there's lots of issues that need to be explored that you may not be aware of, like the great tennis pickleball conflict and issues like that that are already stressing out the use of tennis courts in Albany. Um, so that's my two cents worth. All right, thank you all. Um, I would agree that it is a school district issue. Um, we do need to make sure that the school district is looking at all their options and uh, the indoor court is one. Uh, another one that I thought of, I don't know if it's viable or not, is that there is the area where all the construction equipment is parked, um, which is um, behind the portables next to the new building there. I have no idea if it's appropriate or not, but I, I do believe the school district should be looking at all their options as well. Um, but if it turns out that the only option is the use of city property, then the Parks and Recreation Commission is the proper entity to take up that discussion and, and to receive the, the uh, public comment about that. And I do see the, hate to see the kids lose their courts and absolutely uh, fine. I value highly the um, all kinds of outdoor activities and recreation and sports and uh, and you know, anything that gets kids off their devices and off their computers and uh, away from TVs is is a great thing. So um, <clears throat> I think I see parks and recreation commissioners being very interested in working on this. So I think we need to count on them to minimize the staff time on this and take it on themselves. Um, and, uh, um, you know, do as much as possible working with the school district uh, and, uh, you know, in, involving us, involving the staff as little as possible. 
I do think that this school put, went out for almost $100 million in bond money for construction and that the, those monies could be used to pay for this. So I'm not sure I'm even interested in, in ponying up any of our money uh, if it comes to that, but I am interested in working with the school district. So um, I'm going to support the uh, work plan amendment tonight. Could I ask a question? Yes. So. Um, to Isabel, what if we, if Park and Rec takes pros takes this on? It will need quite a bit of staff support. I mean, you know, I always have these great ideas, and then staff says, "Yeah, but did you think of you know a thousand other things?" And I'm like, "Oh yeah." Um, do we have any idea what and what department that would impact? I mean, Public Works would certainly play a huge role in this. We're telling them, you know, pave those streets, get stuff done, keep moving. If we pull them off to even start to think about basketball courts, you know. You know, Pete, I, I thought about the Memorial Park thing. I thought I had it all figured out. Mm -hmm. And then the engineers had some ideas. It's, it's never quite as easy as, at least as I think. I always think these things are simple, but they're not. Can you give us some estimates about that real ballpark? Uh, well, it would involve uh, more than one department. It would involve certainly the public works. It would involve recreation. It would involve the police department, the fire department, and um, probably also community development in planning, in the planning of the potential location of the new location of the of the court. So it would involve every department basically. For example, the the portables that you see there involved three of our department heads probably for about, I don't even want to estimate the number of hours, but it included our police chief, our fire chief, our community development director, and our public works director. So they look like simple projects, but definitely would take away from other things. Yeah, I, I would, to reiterate what I said before, I, I really think the school district needs to take the lead on this, and we certainly can be supportive. Um, we can work with them, but I think that they need to have their staff working on this rather than our staff. And then when they have some pro a proposal or several proposals, we, then we can work through it at, at that level. I, you know, I, I agree that it is, it is the school board, the, the school district's responsibility. They offered this community, this amenity to the community. Now they've withdrawn it and they need to decide if they're going to offer it again or not. So the decision about a permanent solution to this, to my mind, is a school board uh, and, and school district issue. But if we look at it simply as a temporary fix, and I would suggest even narrowing the charge to the committee, to the advisory committee, to simply looking at the feasibility of adding basketball hoops to the to the tennis courts in the manner um, of this uh, example that has been given to us. Is that a possibility given the use of the tennis courts presently um, and uh, but with the clear, uh, I think perhaps even a contingency, uh, having it be dependent upon the school board agreeing to restore the, the hoops where they were before after the the um, temporaries are removed, that this does not become a, a permanent state of affairs. You know, I'd, I'd also just like to throw back in here that when we had temporary high school back in the, in the 90s, we lost the basketball hoops at that point, and they did come back. It's not to say it's, it's unfortunate that they left, but, but I think the track record is they will come back. Do, do we know what the school board's timeline uh, is on those portables? I, I know they were put up for Ocean View. Are they going to remain there for the Marin? Mm -hmm. So That's they, could, they could be there 10 years. <laughs> in, in, in the two by two by two meeting, I believe four years yeah, was, was an estimate that was cited mm -hmm. in that meeting. And that's an optimistic number, I would say. Could be. Um, uh, so I'm not sure that I want to put any restrictions right now on what the 
uh, commission should study, whether it should be the tennis courts or some other, if, if city facilities or city land is required, um, I'd like to know all the possibilities. Uh, I wouldn't like to constrain them. But I do agree, I think, with all the council members that the, that the, um, the school district needs to step up and, and, and run this. And to the extent that they need our facilities, I'll support the Park and Recreation Commission uh, studying that, studying any impacts and or abilities to work with the school district. So would we make the charge now to allow them to change their, their work plan and take this up? Or do you see us waiting until the school district has uh, considered it? I think that uh, it might be good motivation to say that the uh, school district needs to come with a formal request. Uh, and right now, I think it's just an idea that the basketball, that the tennis courts could be used, but that might be some motivation for the school district to make sure that they understand that we do want them to be the lead on this. I like that idea. And I'd like them, the school district, to come and present to us why they need our help and explain to us why, given the amount of property they own in this town, why you know, using the tennis court is the best alternative. And I'm happy if we get to that point where we think it's a good idea to, to look at city property. I'm fine at that point in having Parks and Rec go ahead. But well, it would be nice to have the school board, have someone at that dais come up and say, please, can we work together? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm okay with okaying the, the work plan amendment tonight because all these folks came out and, and spoke and I'd hate to have them uh, show up again for us to consider this again, but I would support the caveat of we need the formal request from the school board first before they can. And the Parks and Rec um, and Open Space Committee is uh, multi-jurisdictional. It has the two... Um, uh, school district appointees, and they should take what the work of the advisory committee and take it back to the school district as well and get, uh, get you know, the school district uh, to, to partner on this. And I, I do, my big concern, even if this were a great solution, my worry is that we'll do it and then the motivation to deal with hoops for the kids will dissolve. This will, this permanent, this, this temporary solution will become a permanent solution and neither basketball nor tennis would be well served over the long run by this becoming a permanent solution. So my sense, my preference would be that the city offer the temporary solution provided that the uh, school district is committed to providing a permanent solution, but uh, I'm I'm fine with it. I think that uh, Ms. Frank is here hearing us and can take this back to the committee, and we can rely on the committee to to do good work. Uh, Vice Mayor, something occurred occurred to me this evening in hearing all the speakers, um, and Mala, perhaps you need to weigh in on this. The, is the 500 foot rule or the 1,000 foot rule, that pertains to park and rec also, am I correct? Yes. yes. So we may, we may need to look at all of our park and rec commissioners and make sure that no one's We're within 500 feet. Yes, I'm working okay. on the radius. We already did okay, look great. at that. Perfect, thank you. Um, so uh, yeah, I think that uh, certainly we want some sort of, if we, if we uh, sir, I think we want a formal proposal and I think if we have an agreement, we want a formal agreement and uh, clauses like that you stipulate that, you know, if we, if we want only a temporary solution, it is proposed that this is a temporary solution and that the permanent solution is also in the agreement. So, uh, but I think we're far from having a, an, a formal agreement yet. Yeah, and I, I don't think, I'm, I'm not thinking in terms of a formal agreement. I think we, we should be able to work with the school district on a handshake basis. Uh, but, you know, we would want to have a commitment that there is a, I would like to see the school district commit to uh, a permanent uh, solution and the, the reinstatement of the hoops on their property uh, at the end of the, the construction process. But, uh, 
Mm -hmm. I'm happy to leave it to the co to the advisory committee to get to work on it. Okay. Um, does someone is someone prepared to make a motion? Well, so I'm not clear on this really. Um, I thought there was some interest in having someone from the school district at that dais explain to us some of the issues from their perspective. Well, so how, when, when would that happen? I think, I think one of the ideas was we could either approve it tonight and uh, ask the um, Parks and Rec Commission to work with the school district. The other idea I heard was that we could um, approve it tonight with the condition that before the commission works on it, Parks and Rec Commission works on it, we be presented a formal proposal by the school district or, or the commission be presented, someone be presented. So we'll make our modifying the work plan of the commission, our parks commission contingent upon having That's an a idea. presentation from the school board or school district first. Yeah. I mean, I could live with that. An actual request for a formal request. I just have a clarifying question. Um, okay, so definitely I, I hear all, I've written down the notes and all that. I just want to make sure. So then are we, so then we're sort of formally asking them to come back to us with the proposal. I just want to make sure that we're, you know, the, the, our concern as a commission was that we don't have any influence over the school district and we wanted to be responsive to the public. So, you know, I think we, we just didn't, I just want to make sure what we can do is, is, um, realistic and pragmatic that we actually can get the school district to come back and do a formal presentation rather than just, I just fear it, it looks like we're punting and, you know, but I mean, maybe you have more influence than I do. I just want to make sure that we can actually make sure that we bring them to the table so that we can do our work um, rather than waiting for them for a proposal. So, um, um, well, I guess I, part of um, an idea would be to just simply approve the work plan amendment, but I think you've heard the strong preference among the council that we don't see anything going forward unless we have a formal proposal from the, the school district. How about you know? It, it occurs to me that we can, they can certainly talk about this. They can certainly gather information, but I think any action like us actually saying yes, we're going to put aside ten thousand dollars to put up these two hoops or whatever. Is, is going to be contingent on the school board at some point in the process coming before us and telling us this this is our plan where you know these are only temporary we're going to bring back the hoops or whatever but you know that I, I think at least there if we tonight uh, agree to allowing this to go on parks and rec they can begin the process of investigating this and then we can we can make a formal request to the school board or uh, to the district staff, I think the district staff might be the better ones to actually talk to on this and let them say, well, this is our intention in regards to these uh, basketball courts. How, how about something along these lines, okay? Here is what the proposed amendment to the work plan says. To explore reinstalling a basketball court at Memorial Park. The former basketball courts were removed to site portable classrooms. Um, and based on, on this discussion tonight, something like um, um, to examine um, temporary solutions to the elimination of basketball courts associated with school construction um, with the understanding that any temporary solution will be contingent upon school board, um, upon school district funding and a commitment to provide a permanent solution following the school construction, completion of the school construction. I think it does have to be paid for by the school district because this is part of their construct, this is a, uh, a, a construction issue. This was happened because of the $100 million school construction project. So they should be able to find the funds and, and provide them. But uh, I think the city should be open to providing land if it can do so without 
uh, severely impacting anything else that's uh, also a priority. Go ahead, Vice Mayor. Until we have a f financial commitment from the school district, it doesn't seem to me to make a lot of sense to spend any energy of either the commission or the, our staff in thinking about what's possible. We could bring them a wonderful plan and they'd, they could say, we don't want to fund it. Until we have that commitment, I don't see any reason to, to move this forward at all. I, you know, I'd like to point out, you know, the, yes, the schools pr probably do have the responsibility for funding um, at least some of this, if not all of it. Um, but there might be other sources in the community that could step up. Um, we have a very wonderful uh, group, uh, the Albany Community Foundation, <laughs> for one, <laughs> might, might have some interest in this. Um, there could be the uh, parent friends of the um, uh, basketball hoops might form, and they might be able to bring money too. I think the need is that, you know, we've got a bunch of kids that, that need something to do, and I think we're all agreed that playing basketball is a good idea. You know, we can take a long time and process in trying to work this out with the school district, and I, you know, I don't think, at least from the kids' perspective, they have, uh, you know, they're yep. going to be able to take that. And well, we, we have this advisory committee that has both the city representatives and school district representatives sitting on it. So it seems like a logical thing. Sounds venue. like at least three of us are amenable uh, and it's getting close to nine o'clock. I'd say it sounded like you were proposing a motion. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, Anne was able to get it all down. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Shall but, I? Uh, uh, got most of it. <laughs> I can make a... Uh, you want to uh, try or you want to... Did you get enough of it? Should I should I start again? Um, let me pull sure, that. I try uh, restating it, and she can maybe fill in some words. Uh. Okay. So instead, in place of the proposed amendment to the work plan, which was to explore reinstalling a basketball court at Memorial Park, um, this would say um, to explore reinstalling a basketball court. Uh, not reinstalling, because this is a whole new thing, but to explore. Um, installing a temporary basketball court uh, in place of those um, suspended due to construction, contingent upon the uh, school the school district uh, willingness to pay associated costs and provide assurance that the basketball courts that were removed will ultimately be restored. Well, instead of ultimately be restored, be restored following construction. Can you read that back? I have your first one better. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, go ahead with that one then. <laughs> They're intended to be the same. Um, I have to, to examine and explore temporary solution um, in regard to the elimination of the basketball courts associated with the school construction project with the understanding that any temporary s solution is um, contingent upon the, um, when, when the construction project is completed to restore the, uh, with a permanent solution. Well, yeah, we need the the bit about the school that the school district will pay for the willingness to pay associated uh, costs. To, okay, the associated and costs. School district to pay associated costs and the assurance that upon the completion of the construction project, that a permanent solution be restored, or uh, a that, basketball that the basketball hope. courts will be restored. Okay, uh, so moved? So moved. Okay. And, and seconded. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Roll well, call. Uh, yes. Well, for this, I think that's unworkable. I'll just say for the record, I think that's unworkable. I think we really should wait for the school district to come to us, so I'll be voting no on this, but that's it. Okay, thank you. Roll call then. Councilmember Barnes? No. Councilmember Moss? Yes. Councilmember Nason? Yes. Vice Mayor McQuay? No. Mayor Pilch? Yes.
motion carries. Thank you. And thank everyone for coming. And uh, sorry we kept the kids up so late. <laughs> I wish we could thank each and every child. I hope this was a good experience for everybody. It's, to my mind, it's absolutely fabulous to have the kids here and speaking their mind, and, and they should get a lot of affirmation for having done that. It's appreciated. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you. All right, moving on to item 12 to update on stop waste development of reusable foodware ordinance. Um, did uh, staff have a report? Okay, great. Thank you. Good evening, council members. My name is Lizzie Karad. I'm the sustainability coordinator with the city, and I'm here to, tonight to discuss um, what is going on with a uh, possible reusable foodware ordinance. Um, so to get started, I'll give a little bit of background um, on the issue. So a lot of disposable foodware items and to-go ware containers are used every day by many people. Um, a lot of it's plastic, some of it's compostable fiber, but most of the plastic items are not truly recyclable and they're not really compostable, uh, both because they don't fully break down in the standard composting procedure and they're also not, um, when the chemicals break down into compost, the compost cannot get certified as organic compost. Um, so. Uh, also, disposable plastic foodware is often created from petroleum, which drives greenhouse gas emissions, and it's the second greatest source of litter in the Bay Area behind cigarette butts. So uh, many jurisdictions saw this as an issue in their communities, and so we've been working with Stop Waste to discuss reusable foodware ordinances to mitigate this issue. Uh, and the goals of an ordinance would be to reduce litter and plastic pollution, to reduce compost contamination, to reduce the amount of waste sent to landfills, and also foster a culture of reduce and reuse. So over the course of the last year, Stop Waste has been working with agency staff, elected officials and board members, and city managers to get feedback on different approaches to a reusable foodware ordinance. On January 22nd, the Waste Management Authority Board voted to uh, focus on researching existing ordinances, such as the ones that are currently in effect in the city of, of Alameda and Berkeley, um, and to work with additional local businesses to better understand barriers to compliance, uh, unintended consequences, and find lessons learned to incorporate into uh, an ordinance. So the options that went to the board on the 22nd were the option that was approved, which is additional research and data collection uh, that will inform a future ordinance, potentially countywide or a model ordinance. The other two options were the countywide ordinance and a model ordinance. Um, I've listed some advantages and disadvantages to each up there. Um, some things to note are that the model ordinance would give the city a lot of flexibility to decide exactly how to tailor an ordinance to the city. The countywide ordinance would be countywide, so all jurisdictions would hopefully opt in, uh, and it would be enforced by stop waste. But um, again, the board voted on the first option, which is to do additional research and data collection, monitor the ordinances that are in effect in other jurisdictions, and then use the findings from that research and analysis to then go back and decide if we want to do a countywide ordinance or a model ordinance. We also want to bring up a potential fourth option, um, which is to authorize staff to begin stakeholder engagement and work with the Climate Action Committee to develop a draft ordinance that's Albany specific. We um, have been monitoring what's been going on with the conversations with Stop Waste, um, and we found during our climate action planning process, uh, during the community engagement uh, portion, plastic pollution always came up as a big concern, um, both worldwide and also in the Bay Area specifically. 
Uh, in our updated climate action plan that was approved in December, action 3.2.1 is to partner with Stop Waste to develop and adopt an ordinance requiring reusables for dine-in restaurants uh, and to find alternatives for sustainable takeout foodware. And then uh, when we had a discussion with the Climate Action Committee in January, this measure was identified as uh, a priority for 2020 implementation efforts. And in addition, um, because it's been on our radar, staff has already budgeted staff time and funding for implementation of this measure. And we're envisioning that stakeholder engagement would include working directly with the Albany restaurant community to learn about current practices um, and identify any concerns or barriers to success. Um, and we also propose working with the Climate Action Committee to discuss potential ordinance elements before bringing it to a council work session later in the year. Um, and we see this not as a separate item necessarily from what was voted on at the board meeting, but as kind of a complementary. So while that research and data will be going on countywide, we'll also be doing our own work uh, in Albany to find uh, how we can best adopt an ordinance here. But the original recommendation for the presentation tonight was to discuss the ordinance uh, options and to provide some feedback to staff and to stop waste. Uh, thank you. And I'll just add that I, I asked for uh, this to be agendized because I, I think we were supposed to either uh, Mayor Nason or myself were supposed to um, bring this forward to the council before the vote that did already happen. Um, but I, I'm not sure, there might have been a miscommunication or maybe not, but in any case, I thought we ought to at least, uh, I ought to hear from the count, my council members so I know how to proceed in future meetings to stop waste. Um, I'll also say that I think we, the vote at stop waste was the most conservative vote. Uh, the, but that was probably, that seemed to be what most of the members wanted to do. There was only one strong voice, that of Oakland, who wanted to do, go ahead and do a model ordinance or a countywide ordinance, but uh, most of the rest of the jurisdictions were uh, wanting to wait and, and gather data. And I actually supported that as well. I thought that these um, ordinances were um, uh, too new and too few, and uh, gathering data would be a good thing. So, um, but staff has also pre presented us with an, an option tonight as well as the discussion. So uh, I just wanted to give that background and then any questions from my council members? Yeah, I, um, I did not understand that we were supposed to have a board resolution on this. I just understood we were supposed to have community feedback. And so I brought it I put it in the council packets and I took it to the, I met with the plastics, uh, plastic reduction working group in Albany. Um, there was a very strong feeling among that group, which is a different group from climate action. These are people who are really specifically focused on reducing plastics. And uh, I think there was a pretty strong uh, feeling in favor of a countywide ordinance because it would, uh, be the most effective way to deal with it. I think there was pretty much, uh, that was the pretty much the unanimous perspective. The only voices I heard raised against a countywide approach actually came from Alameda, someone representing Alameda who said, we've just done a ton of work on this and we spent a lot of time staff time and we talked to all our restaurants and we worked hard and we came up with our own ordinance and we don't want to switch to a county-wide ordinance now. And I worry that if we do this, we're going to be in that same position, uh, you know, going in with our eyes open uh, to spend a lot of money and come up with a less effective way of, of approaching this. Okay, well, but before we get into discussion, just any other questions about the background? It's not, it's not about the background per se, but could could you explain the difference between this and could you go, and maybe you don't have to go back, and the cities having their own ordinance as a choice? I'm not, I'm not sure why this is different than a model ordinance. So I guess our approach... Um, by doing something Albany specific would be very similar to the model ordinance approach. It's just that um, 
Now that the board has voted to do additional research and data collection, Stop Waste won't be facilitating the model ordinance development until that initial phase of research and data collection has been complete, which will likely be a year or more from now that development would um, begin. I don't think that's correct. I think that the essential difference between the two is that a countywide ordinance will be enforced by the county. Whereas a model ordinance or just developing our own ordinance would be something that we would have to enforce and we don't enforce except on complaint. So, you know, I, I just think it would be far less effective in our case and in most cities' case than a countywide ordinance. Um, I have a question. I, I was on the board during the, when the bag ordinance uh, went into effect, and that was uh, countywide, but cities could opt in or opt out. Are they talking about doing a countywide ordinance where cities didn't have that choice to opt in? Everyone would have to opt in at the same time? I know, I think you could still not opt in. So that's okay. one of the... So if you had the choice of opting in, then I, I'm not sure, clear how uh, Alameda would be worried if they had their, they, if they didn't opt into the county, they could do their own model ordinance, I presume. Yeah, Alameda has their own ordinance right now. Um, right. So they so, would... So if we were, were to do, uh, and I, I essentially agree with Rochelle on this, that I, I think we need to go for a countywide ordinance because, you know, people to get take out stuff in Albany and it goes, you know, somewhere else or they get it in Oakland and it ends up here. Better to have a, a statewide, if anything. But... Uh, it uh, sounds like I couldn't stop the discussion. Uh, uh, let me just see if there's any members of the public who, want, who wanted to speak on this item yeah. before we get into further discussion. Um, I, I still have questions. Oh, okay. Uh, if it's just questions, go ahead. So if we're looking at the research, could be a, a year or more. So let's assume it'll be more because that's common. And then to do an ordinance, whether it's county or a model ordinance, it's another year. We could be talking two or three years down the road, at least before anything happens. Mm -hmm. Am I understanding this correctly? From, from what I understand from the um, information we were given by Stop Waste, the research and data collection is beginning as soon as possible, month or two maybe, and it's a period that will last likely six to eight months at least. That's correct. And Yes, and then once that period ends, they will bring it back to discuss if they want to develop a countywide ordinance or a model ordinance. Leave and it. then once that decision is made, whatever the decision, whatever type of ordinance is chosen, Stop Waste will begin developing that. So yes, it could be a, a couple years following that path. Any other questions? Looks like yeah. we do have a member of the public who would like to comment. Well, they were, should have come up earlier, so I'm fine if they go first. <laughs> I didn't call for public comment earlier, but now I will call for public comment. Uh, please go ahead and, and please uh, speak at the podium. I, I, am, I am a bit mystified. You have to do research. Research on what? I mean, Berkeley has taken some decisions, applied some laws. You have entire countries like France, the European Union has laws against plastics right now, which are effective since January 1st. What don't you, why don't you duplicate that? Which research do you have to do? It's finished, it's over. Everybody knows, okay? Just do what the European Union is doing, copy or Berkeley. It's not difficult. You don't need research, you need implementation. You have all over the world right now, you have absolutely dramatic situations where decisions have to be taken right away. And any delay is deadly for the whole biosphere. You have to see the situation in Australia. I was talking to a friend today who went to Australia. She's American. She's from California, actually. She told me she can't take it anymore. She has to flee. She, the, there was ash everywhere. She's living in the capital city of Canberra. The place where they were going in the national park, they were there, they were by the beach, I've done that for a few years. They were told by law enforcement they had two hours to evacuate. People didn't do that, they went to swim in the sea and they were recovered by the Australian Navy, 
Okay? And now what she wants to do is to leave Australia because she's persuaded the whole continent is going to burn. Now, in the case of plastics, you have a plastic crisis worldwide. You have all these fishes, all these turtles, all these animals who are full of plastic. And uh, you, you know, we are going to do research. You're going to think about it. Nobody, we Albany are going to think. Just copy what wise people have been doing. The European Union has been debating that for many years. They passed the laws that are effective since January 1st. Do the same. Not difficult. I don't understand which research you want to do. Thank you for your comment. No, but what's, it's a question I, I have. <laughs> you know, what, what research, what is this mysterious research you have to do that Berkeley didn't do? Uh, the public comment period doesn't work uh, necessarily as a dialogue, okay. but uh, I think, I think in the subsequent discussion, I think that will become a little bit clearer to you. Okay, that is a very important part of Athenian direct democracy, that people had the right of exchange. When you don't have the right of exchange, you have somewhere above, somewhere below, they are taking the orders in only one way, so that has to be improved. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, let me bring it back to Council. Uh, well, let me just uh, say a couple more items of background. Um, one is that uh, the uh, charter of Stop Waste is to stop waste, stop the production of waste. Right. So, the, their focus is on, you know, not uh, not preventing more waste, but actually just stopping waste from being produced. Um, and that's one of the reasons why they're, they're studying this um, so closely. Um, I will say that uh, a lot of the things that we know to be, or we think are compostable, I've learned through my short time uh, with working with Stop Waste or not. For, for example, many of these um, waterproof cups are lined with plastic rather than uh, uh, food grade wax, which they used to be. So that's not compostable. And many, I have a position paper, which is also public on their website about PFAS, which is uh, something that it gets impregnated into other um, materials like this to make it watertight. And, and uh, the, both those things make those things non-compostable. So a lot of the foodware that we think, even when we get the cups from um, our uh, our food sources, uh, a lot of things we think are compostable actually are not. So I'll stop there and, and let the discussion continue. And I think uh, Council Member Barnes, you were you had some comments. Yeah, um, I have no idea what this ordinance is about. You know, you just mentioned there's an ordinance. So, for example, on Solano Avenue. Let me ask you first question. Have you? discussed any of this with the Solano Avenue Association or any of the, the merchants associations on in Albany? We haven't started any Albany stakeholder engagement. That would be okay. the next step in development. Well, I, I know a few who would love to be consulted. Well, I, I think that was part of the proposal was okay. the, the engagement. So, so, for example, on Solano Avenue, I've never been to a sit-down dining restaurant that didn't use metal knives, forks, and spoons glass, glasses, et cetera, all that stuff gets rewashed. So I think what we're talking about is plastic ware that's for takeout restaurants like Gordo's or restaurants like that. Is that what we're talking about? There would be many elements. Part of it would be takeout ware. Part of it would be requiring that when you sit down in a restaurant, you be served on reusables. There are no, we haven't developed any specifics to any ordinance yet, so it's all just ideas of what elements could be. Um, okay. How about? But there are many elements to consider. Chopsticks that come in paper wrapping, are those considered recyclable? Compostable. They're compostable, but. Not reusable. They're right, there are they compostable, for example? What about if you go to Safeway to buy? because you're having a picnic and you buy plasticware and plates, would those be covered or would individuals still be allowed to buy those in a Safeway store or any other supermarket? I don't know what any of the elements of the ordinance would be because those discussions haven't started yet. It's more 
the discussion right now is what kind of approach to developing an ordinance do we want, not really what will be covered in it. And what will be covered in it will be a part of the development process with stakeholder engagement, community engagement, and then engagement with the council. We don't, we have ideas of what could be included in the ordinance, but nothing has been set in stone yet. Makes sense? I, I guess, I mean, I don't really, really don't know. Well, I, I think have no, I have no big problems with, I just, it's at a very early stage. I'm getting uh, absolutely at a early in stage and the details are to we'll be worked out. But we have a decision to make now, which is, do we want to begin investing in developing an Albany specific approach um, to be sure that we get an ordinance that our community will be happy with, or do we want to be part of the countywide approach? Uh, do we want to wait for the county to bring forth a um, either a countywide approach or a model ordinance? If they come forward with a countywide approach, then we would have basically no decision to make unless it includes an opt-out. If they come forward with a model ordinance, then we would be uh, taking the model ordinance and shaping it to Albany. Personally, I don't think we should begin investing staff time, which uh, is an, you know, this is an expensive process. Uh, we should see if something we can use or that is acceptable to us as a countywide measure comes out of the stop waste project. And for that, and I really have two reasons for that. One is it's more effective. It's better for the environment if this comes out of the count out of the countywide process and is a countywide enforced ordinance. That's the first and most important reason. But the second reason is also diversion of staff resources and budget. We need to prioritize what we do. Why duplicate uh, what, is being, what is happening at Stop Waste? That's my feeling. Yeah, and I, I would agree with that. And that echoes what Pete had said earlier about enforcement. But if, if this were at Albany, um, wide initiative. I don't see us enforcing it. So my question is, so if it's countywide, is the county going to enforce it? I mean, it, there's still an enforcement question. The, the Stop yeah. Waste has their own enforcement staff. They do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they go around and inspect um, restaurants? So they, they do. They Let's do. Let's hear from uh, Vice Mayor and Council Member Moss as well. Well, I, I agree with everything that uh, Council Member Nason said, except for one little detail. And and, and it's not that I'm not agreeing with you. I, I don't like the idea of having to wait two or three years before we do anything. I think this, you know, as the gentleman said, this is, we're, we're in a crisis. We need to be doing something about it. And I just, I don't like the idea of waiting. Um, and the other thing is I'm, I'm thinking that perhaps if, if we have our ordinance and we've worked on it, we've done our research and we're moving forward, we can help shape whatever stop waste does as far as the ordinance, whether it's county or not. Um, and we may have an important role to play there because we'll have some real experience in what, what we've learned. So I, I kind of hate to just wait several more years for them to kind of catch up to us. It's not several more years that they're talking about. They're talking about several more months to develop a comprehensive understanding and a proper implementable approach to the problem. I think that if we do our, uh, we do something that's Albanian, it would be far better for, you know, it would, but it would also have no teeth because we don't enforce. So I just don't think it's, I don't think it's worth it. Uh, we're not talking about several years. And we are talking about an agency with expertise that has already worked on this that can come up with a solution that really will work and will be put into effect. Uh, Councilmember Moss. Um, well, I'm, you know, I, th 
I, I think everyone that's looked at this somewhat, I think we're all sort of somewhat in an agreement here. I, I personally uh, do favor a countywide ordinance for some of the same things that uh, uh, Rochelle's talking about in terms of enforceability. They do have a staff that goes out and looks in garbage cans, looks at restaurants. It's, it's somewhat complaint driven, but it's still, uh, you know, they can, they can do that. Um, I'm not sure that a countywide ordinance is better for the environment just because we could, we could probably come up with something that would be stronger. The downside of a countywide ordinance is even though it might take a few months, it's also a political process that involves getting the okay from uh, people in Livermore, Pleasanton, um, and more conservative parts of this county, uh, some of whom were uh, you know, it took a long time to join uh, the bag ordinance ban. So, um, uh, you know, I, I agree with the comments that were made by the, the, the speaker from the audience that, um, yes, we should just adopt what's going on in, the, in, in, in Europe or in other parts of the world that are light years ahead of where we're, where we're at. But, it, it is a given that we're kind of slow in these things, and, and our sort of system of government is that every jurisdiction on, on, on things like trash sort of gets to decide. Um, I, I do think we should have some uh, uh, explanation or reach out to uh, Solano Avenue Association, the restaurant owners, because they're the ones that are going to have to be dealing with this. Well, when I was on the Waste Management Board, I went out on my own and, and talked with a number of restaurant owners to see if we could get some kind of uh, foodware exchange program going on. Uh, there's a, a, a company that's done that, um, uh, not too successfully as I could see, but that if, the, if they could all agree on different con the same containers, they could be an exchange, they could be going back and forth. I doubt if anything like that would come out of stop waste because it's just, it's too complicated and, uh, you know, I don't think there's the money to, uh, or the, the, the um, want to, to do something that complicated, but that would be the ultimate solution for takeout stuff. Anyway, I, I, would, I would be voting for, at, as the way it's laid out in this, uh, for a countywide ordinance. I, I think stop waste could do this relatively quickly. Okay. Because they've been thinking about it for a long time. All right. Well, the the uh, what's in front of us is to discuss these options. With the first one, which of which has already been picked, and then uh, the second two will be examined after the the six to eight month study is done. But uh, what staff has also brought to us is they can do a, a study as well in in parallel. So I agree. I think we are in agreement that countywide has. Um, is, is better for enforceability. Also, it can be more conf there, there can be more conformity, so that someone traveling throughout the county will have exactly the same um, will encounter exactly the same conditions at every restaurant, which is helpful. Uh, not have to deal with different uh, different regulations at each city. Um, but I do think uh, because of the fact that we share Solano Avenue with Berkeley, um, you know. Studying Solano Avenue, studying our merchants and maybe what they want to do, given that Berkeley, the upper half of Solano will have Berkeley's ordinance and the lower half will not. Um, I think that getting the Albany specific data is also ha has some merit. So I'm not sure that I'd want staff to go ahead and um, go as far as having a model ordinance, but uh, getting the Albany specific data to feed into what Stop Waste is doing so that we can have. Uh, our best say in the matter sounds reasonable to me. Could we have either staff or you, you're the, our stop waste person, right? Could you talk to stop waste and see really a realistic timeline? I mean, I, I'm not sure what. And I mean, they did say six to eight months. That is, that's what they said. Okay. For the study. Yeah. And then another year after that. You know, that that part, I'm not sure about how long it would take to do the model ordinance. I'm not sure it would be a, a whole year. I did or, speak or to someone. White ordinance. I'm not sure. Uh, were you? Do you know exact figures for how long? 
I don't know if they're exact figures, but based on an email exchange today um, from someone at Stop Waste, they said the pilots are expected to last six to eight months from when they are launched. It will take a month or two to design and plan them out, and we are planning to issue an RFP, so there will be some time for this as well. We don't know if the board will direct staff to proceed with an ordinance of any kind until after the pilots. Right, so we don't know what will happen. After. Well, we don't know if it will be a countywide or a, a model. Right. You know, we could just take Berkeley as a model, run it by our uh, restaurants and things, and um, bring it back and adopt it really quick, and then just be prepared to uh, revoke it and sign on to a countywide ordinance if a countywide ordinance comes comes up. And it would be essentially a voluntary thing whether people wanted to uh, follow the ordinance or not, but at least we would have something that they could learn about and try to implement if they're copacetic with it. I suppose that's another option. Are you proposing that but, we think about such an option tonight? Or? Well, I'm just trying to get away from starting a whole new process to develop a whole new ordinance when there's so much work that's been done by others and that's being done by others already. But how uh, about the, uh, just the idea of staff gathering the data from the stakeholders about, um, you know, the Albany specific data? What it's data? Short of an ordinance. What data are we talking about gathering? The or, stakeholders uh, talking with merchants, I think is what but I But talking to them about what? I think it would be their, their reactions to an ordinance and what they would need um, based on a few different ideas of what other, what an ordinance would look like, asking them what they would need to comply, um, what kind of resources they would See, need. All this work is being done. There's nothing different about running a, a restaurant in Albany than running a restaurant in El Cerrito. You know, that there are some certain things that are really basic and people are doing this research. I think that I would, what I think would be useful would be taking to the restaurants the, the Berkeley ordinance and saying something like this is coming. It's going to come either through Albany or through the county. Um, how, you know, and, and it's getting their feedback, but I think it's also just educating people that this is coming and encouraging them in a non, uh, uh, not necessarily a, um, regulatory way, but as a as asking them to do this as a contribution to the community with the understanding that it's it's coming one way or another. But we just use the Berkeley ordinance as a model ordinance. So you're suggesting that staff could do that? Staff yeah. could get that feedback from the merchants about what if we did the Berkeley ordinance? Without this whole issue of trying to develop an ordinance of our own when other folks are working on uh, developing an ordinance. Other thoughts? Are you, are you nodding? Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I, I think we've all said it several times here. Uh, uh, you know, if, if, if it's strictly on this, on, on what we have on our agenda, then I, the feedback is yes, a countywide ordinance and as quickly as possible. Yep. We could leave it there without, uh, without direction of the staff and, and not effectively not directing staff to do this. Correct. Um, mm -hmm. And just leave it at the discussion. Correct. It's the council's pleasure. I think that's, that makes sense. You know, I would go for, uh, I think Rochelle is right. The economics of running a restaurant don't really differ from town to town. Right. Now, I may say that because I live in a corner of town where Berkeley's my backyard fence, 100 meters north of me is Kensington, and if I go on a diagonal, El Cerrito is 150 yards away. So it makes, I think it does make sense to have some standardization across the county. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, so the, our, us not taking action, though, does not prevent the staff from continuing to uh, interact with Stop Waste and uh, monitor their efforts and uh, perhaps uh, as requested, give them, give Stop, Stop Waste Albany's feedback and or, or ideas. Would that be fair? Mm -hmm. Yeah, although I, I do want to emphasize we don't want a huge amount of staff time, of our staff time, put into effort that would be duplicative of what Stop Waste people are doing uh, countywide. Okay. 
All right, so hearing no motion, we'll just uh, end the discussion and move on to the next item. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, next item is agreement with uh, Godby Research to provide voter polling services. I assume, um, City Manager, you have a report? Yeah, I will keep it brief and um, keep it open for council questions more than anything. This is basically following up on the potential for ballot measures with specific regard to revenue measures for um, ensuring the maintenance and continued stability of our overall general fund budget. Um, I had a phone call after your last council meeting with Godby Research, who's done our polling in the past, wealth of expertise in that firm. And uh, the suggestion was that, well, as we all know, it never hurts to get an input of the community in terms of uh, level of support for measures. And it help, may help inform the discussion as we move forward if we are uh, considering revenue measures and what level or threshold those numbers should find themselves resting at for support of the voters. Uh, so what you have before you there is the proposal from the Godby Research Polling Group. Uh, there's a graduated level of rates. We would look to try and keep it as economical as possible. If you recall, we did this before the last election as well, and the council authorized a subcommittee of the mayor and vice mayor to work with staff on the, um, the suggested questions. The, the polling firm works with those questions a bit more to make sure that they're understandable to those polled. Um, but with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Questions from council members. Um, I, I have one one question. Uh, I think uh, um, one of these measures, uh, uh, the um, transfer tax, was was attempted to be raised in two thousand eight, but it failed. Had we done polling research before that? Uh, you know, interesting question. I'm not sure. I'd have to go back and look. But it was a significant increase. I think it was about $4 that they were intending on raising it at the time. Yeah. And it was a pretty shaky time in the economy as well. But I'm not sure if we did polling before that. Well, I, 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 would, I, would, I just found myself asking, uh, it, have we ever done some kind of correlation between polling data that we have done on bonds or, say, the school district has done and how closely that polling data came to what the actual vote was? I haven't followed up. I normally look for the two-thirds number on the, uh, the results of the election and, and breathe a sigh of relief. So, mm -hmm. no, I haven't gone back to correlate specifically. I mean, I mean I, you know, I'm willing to do this. It makes a certain amount of sense if it's going to give us the right information to be able to, you know, figure out what the, the no, those numbers are. But I was just curious, has, have, have, have we looked at this firm? I mean, is, have any of the firms that do this kind of info, uh, polling data, um, do they have data as to how well they did in predicting certain Sure, elections? and we could definitely pull that together. I can say that typically how the measures have tested are how they've turned out in the election, because you test to make sure that you'll, you will get the two-thirds, or you test to make sure you'll get the 50 percent plus right. one. Right. I understand. So, yeah. I understand. But, you know. Good point. Yeah. yeah. All right. Any other questions? Uh, if not, any uh, public comment on this item? Uh, seeing none, I'll bring it back for discussion. Any uh, concerns, questions, discussion? Yeah, I, I have to say I don't agree that there is no downside um, to polling because polling does not just gather information. It begins a conversation. Somebody who got the call is going to post on next door. Hey, I got this call. What do you think? And people start weighing in. And um, I, uh, I have to. So you know, there is a substantive question there, um, as w and a timing question. Uh, I feel this is not the time to do it. I think, and I just mean, even even pulling it right now. Remember, we are, our most recent audited financials that are available are from June 30th, 
2016. And do we want people to start talking about that on Nextdoor in the context of being asked if they're receptive to a new tax? That troubles me. I think what we need to do is we need to get those audited financial statements. We need, and the other thing we haven't done is we haven't told people how we're programming out the Measure M taxes that they approved um, in, that they have already approved. That's the second thing I think we need. And a third thing that I think we need is an infra some understanding of our infrastructure needs, which was a recommendation in the past that we have not yet done, that I know the current staff is working on hard. But I think we need to have to be able to put any tax proposal into the context of all of our obligations and not just be saying, well, we're going to have these enormous bills coming in the future for pensions, so we just need more money and we need it as soon as possible. Um, I just think this, I, th I think this would be uh, very potentially counterproductive to ultimately building support for, uh, for whatever tax or other, other proposals people have talked about, you know, a billboard, um, whatever proposals we might might want to consider for raising revenue. But I think we need to have, as a city, we have to have our act together financially just before we even begin, before we even trigger a, a conversation about this. Other comments? When would we do the polling? a fine line uh, within the next month or so. It's in between when um, tax season and uh, the March election. So you would probably have results back, I think it was early May. And, and these are all standard uh, phone calls, polls? It, it, well, it's a variation of, of the good old phone call because of how people receive surveys now. So they do have uh, a couple of other mechanisms that they reach out to people. Yeah, because my, you know, my understanding is people are giving up their land landline. Landline doesn't work. Nobody yeah. wants to answer their phone anyway, even if they have a landline. Um, yeah, if it's landline, you're going to get um, you're going to skew much older than the electorate. Hey, be careful. Pardon? Be careful. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so what's... So I guess one question is, do we want to be prepared to put this on the fall ballot or not? Because if we are, then we need to get this to the county by what, July? Is that right? So I'm, I'm not able to hear you, Michael. If we want to have this on the fall ballot, we need to get it the proposal to the county in July. So we need to some time. So I'm just working backwards from those dates. We would need to get this done and far enough ahead of July that we have time to discuss it and then decide what we want to do and what we want to ask for in July. Mm -hmm. So unless we are considering not doing this at all in the fall. Mm -hmm. I think we should consider not doing it in the fall, personally. You know, people have a huge bond commitment, uh, or rather tax commitment, uh, coming up for the school district, and uh, it may be just piling on. And this is a difficult type of tax, too. You know, this is, uh, this, many people, are not saving for retirement, but counting on their equity as their retirement plan. So we're proposing to take out of their retirement plan and put it into our retirement plan, uh, into our, our staff's city retirement plan. And that, that, that can get kind of dicey. Um, there's a lot to think about here, and I, I'm not sure that, that planning this for the November election is really timely, especially considering our financial planning and reporting needs. Okay. 
Well, I think we've heard you loud and clear. I support strongly putting tax measures on the ballot in November. I had a discussion with the finance manager about the uh, upcoming uh, pension obligations we have, and uh, I think we all knew anyway that the it, it looks grim. Uh, you know, we we're going to have to put out a lot more money. Uh, in terms of uh, you know, if the seniors are affected, we can always have a senior exemption. We we already have the. Uh, the direction to staff to give lower, uh, uh, lower, um, uh, low income. Low income, thank you, uh, exemptions. So uh, there's always those mechanisms for reducing people's tax burdens. And I also think that uh, if, even if we did no new taxes were passed, uh, many seniors are getting tax increases every year because they bought their home so long ago that they're getting that 1% each year that they have to, 1% increase every year they have to pay anyway. I'm strongly in support of these new taxes. Um, and I'd, lo I'd love to hear if I have support among the council members for that. But um, I also I also think that uh, data is good. Uh, that you know, this is the, these polling organizations are professional organizations. They know how to do the polling. Uh, they get the most scientific data that they can uh, doing a mechanism like this. So I think we'll get good data. Um, I think that. People may talk, but I think the people who talk, especially the people on the next door, are the small subset of, of residents. I think that 99% um, of the people are got their heads down with their kids or with their jobs and are, are, not, uh, are not gossiping about tax measures. But um, I, could, I could be wrong about that last part. Anyway, I, I think that we, we, this, the staff recommendation is good and, and we ought to, uh, ought to go forward with that. Even if we don't do the tax measures, we'll have some data in front of us about whether we should or not. Yeah, I think I would agree with that. I, I, it, yeah, just getting the data doesn't mean these measures will go forward. Uh, they, we may find from the data that it's a terrible idea. Um, it would also actually be useful if, if this does crop up on next door as a, a, you know, that's telling us some information also that, about how popular this might be. Um, I, uh, you know, th that's not to, take it out of the, you know, is, that's not to say that it isn't important that we get our financials straight and we yes. get all this okay. stuff done because that's gone on way too long and I agree with Rochelle on that. But um, I, I think just gathering data, uh, particularly on these things that, that we're going to need the money down the pike, we, we should do. The question I think for me about financials is at the time of the election what will we know about our financial status then? I mean, the CAFR will be, we'll have our CAFRs up to date by then, correct? Yeah, you should receive your CAFR in the month of March. Uh, hopefully the CAFR itself will come to the council uh, as a document, and it, well, it will in advance of whatever meeting that you receive the CAFR. Uh, the other information you have from your quarterly budget updates and from adopting the budget is that we are in a budget deficit, and so, as my responsibility is to try and manage that as best as possible. And this is one of the many solutions that I'm working towards is discussing revenue measures because it probably is something that needs to be discussed. It also means looking at our budget closely and figuring out where we can minimize our expenses. But as you know, that comes with challenges because the majority of it in a small city is staff time, is our salaries, and, and that's just the reality of our situation. Now, the other thing about doing polling now may be that we find out that there is such a negative reaction to the idea of a tax that we decide not to do it. But, but it's hard to argue against finding out how the electorate is feeling, I think. I think the risks, as Nick pointed out, of prejudicing the, the outcome are pretty low. Seems like we have the majority in agreement with the staff recommendations. Does someone uh, want to move that? We can always have more discussion. I guess there, there's just one more point that I'd like to be sure everybody understands, because this all will be in next door within a pretty short period of time. It's 
and, and I, I, it may come from me. It, it may come from me, yes, because I don't yet support this idea. I might support it in the future when I see the whole big picture and say, yeah, we actually, you know, we have a plan. We know how much it's going to cost, and this is part of what we have to do. Um, but one thing that troubles me, you know, when we talked about this the last time, I was thinking of it as if it were a capital gain type of tax. And, you know, I, I have that mentality. I uh, uh, went through that not too long ago. Um, but this is not a capital gain tax. This is a transaction tax. And there is widespread agreement that there's going to be, um, at some point, we will see another correction. Hopefully not the 2008 level of a correction, but there will be a correction. And there will be families in Albany who find that their homes are worth less uh, than they paid for them. And then if they sell them, they not only have to, to bring money to the table to get rid of the house that they were planning on using towards their own retirement, but they're going to have to pay a big tax to the city. And, uh, you know, that could get... And, and by the way, I want to say, I'm, I'm not worried about it passing. I think that people in Albany, we're all progressives who trust government and want to find collective solutions to the problems we all face. I think they'll vote for it. But I think there comes to be a sort of breach of trust if we just... Pile, you know, pile it on and don't think about the consequences to the people who actually have to pay the taxes. Okay. What's in front of us is authorizing the gathering of data. Does someone want to move the motion? I'll move the motion if I can find it. Okay. It's resolution number 2020-13. And, and there's a second part to this, too. Establish a subcommittee comprised of the mayor and vice mayor to work with right. staff and the consultants and and and... I think that's fine, personally, but okay. this is so we know right. what we're so, doing. Okay. Are you moving that then? Yeah. Well, yeah, I can move uh, motion 2020-13, uh, authorizing the city manager to enter into an agreement um, uh, not uh, in the amount not to exceed $30,875 to provide voter polling services and establish a subcommittee um, Comprise, comprised of the mayor and vice mayor to work with staff and the consultants to develop the voter polling survey. I'll second that. All right, motion and a second. Any further discussion? Please call the roll. Councilmember Barnes? Yes. Councilmember Moss? Yes. Councilmember Nason? No. Vice Mayor McQuay? Yes. Mayor Pilch? Yes. And motion the motion carries. carries. Thank you all, and let's move on to item 12.4, nuclear power from PG&E. So uh, I see we have a member of EBC uh, in the audience. Thank you, Dan, for coming out. Um, so uh, I, I took it upon myself, I, I was not asked by EBC to bring this in front of you, but I thought that I, I'd better, since it's such a hot button issue. And uh, the issue before you is that um, EBCE can get nuclear power attributes for free from PG&E. Um, and it is free, but it's nuclear power attributes. So that comes with uh, perhaps a, a big burden of uh, a community distaste. And so I wanted to see if uh, the council wanted to direct me in a certain way or allow me to just uh, vote my own way and with that, um, that is the, the item. Any, any questions? Well, I, I immediately came up with a few. Um, what's in it for PG&E? Uh, I mean, why, why is PG&E giving away this power for free? Uh, can I use my discretion to call Dan to the podium, or uh, would you be able to speak to that question, Dan? If not, I can try to answer it. But. Hi, Dan Lieberman with East Bay Community Energy. Um, there's, there's no transfer of funds from EBCE to PG&E for these attributes, so there's nothing in it, I think, for, for PG&E. They've been directed 
they've they've basically sold some excess power in the market at a loss. Um, customers of EBCE pay a fee called the power charge and difference adjustment to cover that loss. And because our customers are paying that fee, the California Public Utilities Commission determined that we should be entitled to make claims on those attributes. And that relieves a burden of EBCE to buy more carbon-free attributes to meet our carbon-free obligation. That's where the savings opportunity is. So, so, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but the way I would interpret it is that in, in some way we have paid for this, are, are paying for it. So it's just a question whether we accept this as uh, in return for what we've paid for these, these other things. Correct. Okay. And there also is an offer of large hydro as well uh, for free, um, but the, I think the, ish, uh, the thinking is that that would be non-controversial. The nuclear is the more controversial one. Okay. And then a, another question that I had, um, you, you mentioned in the report that uh, this won't encourage the nuclear market particularly. No, no reactors will be built if we start using this energy. But in any way, will it affect um, uh, East Bay uh, Community Energies um, establishing more uh, carbon-free, uh, uh, you know, um, energy sources, or or discourage doing that? Uh, will it affect um, uh, the construction of any of these things in any way? Um, I I don't think so. I'm a little. Real, I'm not representing uh, any official position of EBCE here, but um, I would say we've taken a very aggressive path to building new renewable energy facilities. In 2019, we contracted to build 550 megawatts of wind and solar, 130 megawatts of battery storage. There's nothing here that would slow down that that pace. I think we're going at a pace that's as aggressive as our revenues will allow, and this just wouldn't interfere. Could, could, could this conceivably allow even a faster pace of, of that kind of construction? Um, I mean, if we take these allocations, then that frees up some budget, and we haven't made a statement on what we would use that uh, money, that revenue for. Okay. Yeah, I think the discussion at the, from the last board meeting that I attended was attended was that it could be used for a number of different purposes, including the local business um, development plan and perhaps, uh, you know, accelerating uh, the, the building of new mm -hmm. um, energy sources. Uh, I don't know if you heard anything at the meeting you attended. No, the we didn't talk a whole lot about this. I did put two um, articles at your place, or if mm -hmm. somebody did. Um, there were t two letters that we received at the last board meeting, one from East Bay Clean Power, um, talking more of the financial piece. I, I can't speak to it at all. It was just given to us. And the other one from a woman in Berkeley. But I did want you to see what, what the board received at the last meeting. Yeah, so the, the advocates, it's pretty clear that the, the, the advocates do not want uh, EBC to accept these nuclear power attributes. Any other questions? Public comment? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, could I just ask one quick question? Would it, would the power, I remember this, the issue of the power mix coming up um, when we were, making the choice between bright choice and brilliant 100 and renewable 100. So would this be part of the mix for renewable 100 as well as uh, this would, our brilliant 100? Yeah, this would most likely show up exclusively for bright choice. Oh, okay. Uh, the GHG free. The GHG free and brilliant 100 and renewable 100 would remain in the current mix, so. And we picked Brilliant 100 as the default for our customers. Correct. So, yeah. And if, if EBCE does not take the allocation, then this will show up on the power content labels of other PG&E customers. That's, it's going to show up in one place or another. Yeah, OK. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dan. Um, public comment, please. 
Sorry about that. So I, I think we have a carbon crisis. I think the carbon crisis is way worse than the nuclear crisis. And I think a lot of people have to be educated about that. They're not. They fear nuclear power because they remember nuclear war. And also the, the Diablo Canyon, the nuclear power plant, which is the last one in California, is going to close within two years or something like that. Okay? It's a second generation plant. We need nuclear power, and there will be nuclear power in the future, because the sustainable energy may work for California alone, with a lot of fancy footwork. But for the rest of the planet, there are many places which are not like California. They cannot have the same hydro. They cannot have the same sun. They cannot have the same wind. So nuclear will be developed, and it will be developed also for space. And, but it will be fourth, fifth, or sixth generation nuclear. It's possible to make nuclear, which actually doesn't pollute. For example, based on thorium, which is uh, an element which is found in enormous quantities. So this is a good occasion, actually, on the last remnant of second generation nuclear power in California to educate the so-called activists and progressive, who actually, it's good to be an activist. I'm an activist. I'm a progressive. Um, but one has to do it in an intelligent fashion. One has to be really informed. I do agree that second generation power plants are very bad and they have to be closed. And it's good Dimebrook Canyon is closed. And, but fourth, fifth, sixth generation power plants can be made which won't pollute anything at all. If you look at the Fukushima thing, it was unfortunate. Free reactor exploded. It was completely their fault. They mismanaged the thing as much as possible. And these were second generation plants. But it was basically nobody killed. Whereas, uh, by the estimate of the WHO, the World Health Organization, there is at least 7 million, maybe many more times than that, of people killed by fossil fuel. Even in Albany, every year, there are probably hundreds of people dying because of fossil fuel. Nobody is going to die because of nuclear power, as long as we don't get a bomb from North Korea in Albany in the close future. So I think it's a good occasion to do it. It's, it's pretty nothing. It will save some money for uh, better things by doing that. And it's an occasion also to start educating a progressive fringe who is very noisy but does not think very much because nuclear power, once again, will have to be part of the nuclear mix, it's of the energy mix. It's like, for example, another example is hydrogen. Hydrogen was killed by Obama, which was a big mistake. Now uh, Trump and company are starting it again. And it's starting in Germany because Germany has realized that. Thank you. Okay, so we have to keep on progressing. Thank you very much. Okay, bringing it back to the council. Uh, thoughts? Um, well, I'll give you my own thought first. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I think about this very pragmatically. To me, it's we're not, the EBC is not generating, not building new, new nuclear plants. They're not, um, this plant is, will be decommissioned definitely in 2024, 25. Um, we're simply, it, it's a financial benefit to EBC to accept this, this power and uh, the, the, there's no indication that the plant will shut down any time before that. So why not accept the power and, and have a cost savings for EBC? I agree. Um, okay. Yeah, right. I, I, I would agree also. Um, okay. Yeah, I cool. mean, don't, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Uh -huh. okay. and, and that's what this seems to be. Yeah. Well, I just want to say one thing. I agree with that. And if that's how the discussion goes, I'm perfectly happy for you to vote in favor of it. But I also want you to, at least in my opinion, know that if, the, if something comes up in the discussion that you feel like, whoa, wait, that's not what they said originally, you should feel free then to say, no, we don't think, I don't think this is a good idea. So it gives you, a, this is what we'd like, but you know how sometimes something pops up? then I think you should have the freedom to say, that's nah, okay. not what we thought. So you're in favor of uh, not necessarily directing me to do anything other than use my own discretion, which is what I, all of us would do at any of these. Uh, right, with the meetings. idea that we're supporting yeah. the idea. Okay, got it. Yeah. Council member. You know, I should abstain since I have never voted to do East Bay Clean Energy in the first place, but I am in generally 
sympathetic to what you're saying. And I would like to point out New York Times just had an article today that said uh, because Japan is not going to restart its nukes, they are building 22 new coal-fired plants in Japan, and in the future will have 25% of its electricity from coal. I'm sorry to hear that. And, um, and when we shut down the, the nukes, when we shut down Song, the San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station, we burned gas t to make up the difference. And this gentleman is from France, I believe, where they get 75% of their electrical power from nuclear. And Germany made, I think, a huge mistake in shutting down their nukes, which were some of the best run in the world. And what they have done is tr they, they've tried to substitute renewables for the nukes that they got rid of, which means Germany not only has the most expensive power in Europe, they're also burning more coal than they ever did. So... I agree. Nuclear needs to be part of the mix going forward. So, uh, in in general, I support the stance of the council. Okay. So, it sounds like there's support for uh, doing nothing, which was my recommendation uh, three or four, four, I guess. So. All right. If if we can wrap that up, great, and we can move on to the next item. And next item will be item. Uh, 12 5 is council subcommittee reorganization. Thank you again, Dan. Um, see you. And uh, is there a staff report for this? Or, okay, I think there was a uh, comment either at our retreat or some other time that we should take a look at these subcommittees again. So here they are. What should we do? <laughs> I think I requested this. I think that, as you can see, most of these are uh, uh, Vice Mayor McQuaid and I, but I think that that was sort of based on uh, our, uh, our, the positions that we held at the time the subcommittees were formed. I would like to step down from uh, two of them. I think that, uh, and I, for both of them, I think that the mayor should be the... Uh, uh, the mayor and vice mayor should be the subcommittee, and that is the Alta Bates Hospital uh, and the community inclusivity. Uh, Alta Bates Hospital is an extraordinarily um, important issue and is led by Mayor Aragin, and uh, I think it just should, uh, uh, although El Cerrito is not represented by its current mayor, it has Rochelle Pardu Okamoto, um, she is a nurse at Alta Bates, so there's a very special reason for her uh, representing the city. I think the mayor should be uh, representing the city. And with community inclusivity, I think that also um, that issue is one of such importance and sensitivity to the community as a whole that the mayor should, uh, should take that position as well. So just I'd to like to stay on the bulb and the San Pablo Avenue corridor. Okay, and just to clarify something, so I was, you stepped down from the task force, which is something that the uh, Mayor Argin's office um, organizes. Uh, was that something you were doing with Vice Mayor McQuaid? Or yes, something? yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and, but they reached, and I think you communicated with them, and I said that I, I certainly would be happy to step up and, and do that. Um, and I, does that mean, um, Vice Mayor McQuaid, you'd be also interested in continuing that? Are you referring to the, the homeless and the, the county one? Is no, that? no, the Alta Bates one. Oh, the Alta Bates one. Oh, yeah, <laughs> definitely want to stay on okay. there. Okay, all right. So, um, yeah, I've already, I think I've already kind of stepped up to that one, so I'm happy to fill in for Councilmember Nason on that one. Uh, and then inclusivity. Um, I'm certainly happy to continue that one as well if you'd be willing to work with me on that one. Of course. Okay. Great. What if I'd said no? <laughs> <laughs> well, then we'd talk about it. <laughs> I'm pleased um, to. And then I know I see that uh, myself and Councilmember Moss have not yet reported on our, our cannabis ordinance subcommittee. Um, I'm afraid that's uh, mostly my fault. We did have some preliminary discussions and we met with some. Um, or a potential um, business person, mm -hmm. uh, or a business person who's interested potentially in Albany, but then things kind of stopped. So um, I think we, 
I think we want to continue that, and I think it's on us to make sure we report back, perhaps at the next meeting or at the latest, the next one after that, on our on our progress. So that's that one. Um, and there's there's youth engagement and uh, waterfront park that we haven't talked about. Uh, are you? Are we okay with continuing those two? Mm -hmm. as yeah, we have designated youth engagement has an event coming up next next month. So we. Okay. I'm sorry. What was that? Youth engagement has an event next month. Who does? Youth engagement. Oh, youth engagement. Okay. And uh, you requested Councilmember Nason to continue on the waterfront, and I guess uh, Vice Mayor, you're okay with continuing yeah. that as well. So. Um, I guess we're not sunsetting any of these subcommittees, it looks, sounds like, and are, is there a need to add any more? Okay, just a slight reorganization. So uh, substitute uh, Pilch for two of them and, and we're good. Well, in a sense, you and uh, Vice Mayor McQuaid will be a subcommittee in working with the staff on the, the Godby research. Right, 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 and that yeah. was authorized by the previous, uh, one of the previous items, so. Okay, great, all good? All right, moving on, and. I have the adjournment thing when, you, when we get there. Oh, thank you very much. Um, and uh, moving on to future agenda items, are there any future agenda items anyone would like to bring up? I do note that there were a few that um, uh, you brought up last time the last meeting, Council Member Nason, and I, I still have them noted and have not yet discussed them with uh, the um, city manager. Yeah, and uh, the city manager and I have emailed each other, and uh, I think that uh, she has, has thoughts on uh, scheduling that. Okay. And we will talk. Anything else? Any other future agenda items? If none, uh, we see the, um, there's the announcements of city meetings and events. And finally, um, the vice mayor is going to help me adjourn the meeting. We're, we're adjourning our meeting tonight in memory of Jack Stewart. He's, he was the son of Nancy Marsh, a, a member of our finance department. While I didn't know Jack, I recently reconnected with Nancy, who had worked with me at Albany Pool many years ago. In reading the memories of his friends, I feel like I knew him. He was one of those amazing young people who bring joy and light into the lives of so many. I'm taking the liberty of sharing some of the thoughts of his friends written upon his passing. Jack started working with the city of El Cerrito in 2014 and touched many lives while working there. Not only did he lifeguard, but he was promoted to senior lifeguard this past summer, started teaching water aerobics, helped out in the childcare program, was Santa at the pancake breakfast, and often DJed at events. Jack was funny and goofy, caring and kind, and enthusiastic about everything he did. He will be greatly missed. Jack was unapologetically himself all the time, and that person was bright, cheerful, and fun. The kids truly loved Jack's jokes, his childish ways, and his love for having fun. Jack was also Santa in the last, for the last couple of years. He was an incredible special light who made every day at the community center more fun, outrageous, and love-filled. His kindness and willingness to serve, to try new things, and work ethic were truly inspiring. Jack was so full of life and such a joy to work with. He always made me smile, and he will be missed so much. You were always so silly with your voices and made work fun. Heaven has gained a colorful character. Thank you, Jack. Thank you for every time you lit up our days and made us smile. Your present was, presence was so big and so loved. Thank you for every time you helped me out, encouraged, uplifted, and empowered me. You will always be missed and never forgotten in our hearts. So let's take a moment to remember this incredible young man. Thank you for that, Vice Mayor, and with that, we are adjourned.